Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Hoor je mij?
just you and me in the moonlight. I'm in the mood for love.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome at the Odyssey Track Deep Dive of the Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations. Please welcome your hosts of today, Wouter Welling. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Wouter Welling. I'm a coordinating policy officer here at the ministry. Normally, I work on policy briefs, so it's pretty exciting for me to be standing in front of a large crowd of people who probably regularly do not end up at the basement of a governmental ministry. Uh, so, uh, a warm welcome to all of you guys. Um, I'm very excited to have a group of people here, um, which is very mixed, which consists of people who work in government, people who work in startups, people who work in the corporate world, people from abroad. Um, so, I'm very excited to have such a diverse group here at the ministry. Um, we're going to have a very busy program, which consists of the challenges we have, some speakers who we flew in from abroad who know a lot about these topics. Um, but first of all, I would go to, um, let's say, formally, she's my boss. Um, this is uh, Marike van Wallenberg, who is the Director General for Government and Organization here at our ministry to give you a warm welcome and explain what we're doing over here. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah? Um, I'm using a piece of paper. I hope you forgive me. Uh, welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, scientists, entrepreneurs, students, developers, hackers, and the live viewers. <laughs> welcome. It's an honor and a pleasure to see you here at the Ministry of the Interior. I'm proud to host this event, the 21st Century Citizenship. Track Deep Dive, it's a long title. One of the many deep dives on our way to the end goal, the Odyssey Hackathon in April. Uh, we work in an ever-changing environment. Today is different from yesterday, and tomorrow will not be the same as today. Our challenge is to be adaptive, always, because every day our job is to work with and to work for a continuously changing society. We are here to contribute to a righteous, modern, and sustainable society. <coughs> in our country, we believe it is important that people and organizations can live and work safe and free. That may seem very obvious and evident, but to work and live safe and free should never be taken for granted. Public administration invests in securing these values for now and for our future. This is the reason why I wake up every day with a smile, and I hope you do too. Uh, we must adapt to the rapidly changing technologi technological developments. Uh, when it comes to that, a government cannot afford to simply wait and see. We need to be where the, where the innovation is happening. We need to work together with you as experts. Uh, however, we also need to be careful Rapid implementation of new technologies does not automatically mean a guarantee for success. Uh, certainly not in large organizations such as the government. That's, uh, that is why I agree with the vision of Odyssey, commonization. New technologies and infrastructure work much better in our globalized in interconnected society when it is commonized. When it becomes part of the digital common, a beautiful goal for our ministry. Another necessity in this quickly advancing society is to decide, and this is difficult for us, when the government wants to be in charge and when a more modest approach is more at place. We as a government must slowly abandon the habit of wanting to exercise full control over citizens' data as we are not the owner of somebody's data and identity. We need to think about new ways of letting loose. And I repeat, that's difficult. Luckily, technology is here to help and to assist us. Blockchain is one of those potential technologies that could offer an opportunity. Thanks to blockchain technology, and users and end users only will be able to manage their own identity and other personal information. This could be a good fit between our ambition to let loose and the wish of Dutch citizens and entrepreneurs to have more control over their own personal data. 
I'm happy and proud that we participate this year with two challenges, namely the next generation digital ID and the privacy breach detector. After me, my colleagues will explain the challenges in detail. Dear guests, dear future co-workers, diving is a particular sport. It is an individual sport, but you can never dive in the deep on your own. Divers use codes to communi communicate with each other. On your own, you can come far, but at the end, you need the other. You need the other divers to dive safely and to be able to see the depth of the sea. I promise you a wonderful dive in the ocean this afternoon, and I wish you a lot of inspiration and success with these challenges. Have a nice day. Thank you, Marike. Thank you, Marike. Um, after this brief introduction, I'd like to tell you about a phone call I received around three years ago. It was from a guy who told me that they were organizing a hackathon. And I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. And uh, after a while, we found out that this was not just a hackathon. This was, um, which turned out to be the largest blockchain hackathon in the world. And this guy also seemed to have a pretty big idea about how we should organize these kind of things. Um, let's hear from him about what Odyssey has become. Uh, Rutger van Zuidam. Thanks, Wouter. Let's see if we can find the yeah, click it here. Ah, here, there it is. Thank you, Wouter. Thank you, Marike, for the warm welcome. And Thank you all for, uh, for, uh, for being here, for joining us uh, to explore the challenges of, uh, of, the, of the ministry. Um, and I'm particularly excited today because I think uh, these challenges are highly connected to other challenges in the, in the Odyssey Hackathon. <coughs> uh, so uh, talking about uh, connecting collaboration, um, the whole idea of Odyssey is that, uh, well, we don't know what the future will look like, but if we build it ourselves, then we are part of that. So uh, that's where I all would like to ask you and challenge you to, to see uh, where the connections can be made with, uh, with the other challenges. Uh, also, if you want to work on the challenges of the ministry, because in each challenge for all the prototype types, we are looking for the most interconnected solutions. And why is that? Well, this uh, was our first uh, hackathon, and um, we had a challenge from, uh, for digital identity already uh, back then. It was in uh, 2017. And the challenge was contributed by the guy over there, André de Kok, from uh, the State Service of uh, Identity, uh, identity Services. Um, and we had uh, two challenges. Uh, uh, one of them was very interesting also, the refugee passport. And I think uh, that was the first uh, really good tangible example, uh, I think it was by an uh, IBM team, of a uh, idea of uh, what uh, uh, sovereign identity, or at least what looks like that, could mean not just for, uh, for Dutch people, but in fact on, on a much larger scale and in a, a, a very different context what the importance is of sovereignty in a situation where trust is an issue. Right? We live in a high trust society. But I think that we can say that what is true and what we trust is continuously evolving. Right? So identity is also continuously evolving. And that's what we learned from the get-go. So it's this, this search for uh, identity solutions is in the DNA, not just f for this hackathon, but in the DNA of this ecosystem, this network of, uh, of builders, because that's what you all are. And in the second year, uh, we did it again uh, with, uh, uh, with the Ministry of the Interior, and they made a huge, huge step. And namely, uh, I was... Last year we were here 
uh, diving into the challenge as well. And uh, Mr. Uh, Raymond Knops was here as well. And um, yeah, he asked me, should I come to the hackathon? And I said, mm, that would be awesome. And he drove from Venlo to uh, the hackathon. He was there the whole Sunday. And this gained a lot of insights of what happens, what can happen when different stakeholders within a complex challenge are uh, at the spot collaborating with the teams. And I think this is what we can take forward even further this year. Um, the 2019 edition. Um, a bit hey, of a hey, hey. You're not into cryptocurrency to make a quick buck. You're in this because you're building a system that enables everyone to participate and benefit. You're not in blockchain to make the status quo more efficient. You're in this to reinvent the way we organize society for the 21st century. You're part of a global movement. Our biggest problems today are shared problems. Problems no one owns. Problems that we need to solve together in the commons. We need interconnected collaborative communities and they need new digital public infrastructure to support that. This is infrastructure that nobody owns but everybody can use and build on top of that. This April, 1,500 selected pioneers will be on the move from all over the world. You bring together the coders, you bring together the people with the creative ideas and the, the potential clients, you know, the, the businesses. So it's the government and the corporates. This will be the third edition of the biggest blockchain hackathon on Earth. 20 challenges by corporate and governmental launching partners, 100 teams, 200 supporting experts, including regulators, 200,000 euro in cash rewards, connecting ecosystems, unlocking new markets, discovering the future by actually building it together. This is the way to move beyond the hype toward the commonization of our digital public infrastructure. Join 1,500 builders in Groningen, the Netherlands, we have prepared. Real challenges are waiting for real solutions. When we initiate such an infrastructure, you unlock a completely new market for everybody in the space. We are offering you a new market with launching partners that understand why you are in this space. They will build with you. Two registrations are open from January 18th until February 25th. Unlock your potential. Build your odyssey. I was, <laughs> I was already looking forward a bit to watch it on this screen in this uh, like movie theater uh, 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 room. So, um, doing a blockchain hackathon, uh, AI, whatever kind of technology, it's nice. But we, we deliberately took uh, uh, an, a direction, uh, I think after this summer, when we killed our block changers brand and we started developing on, on a new story. Um, because this whole thing, of course, blockchain can help, but it's not really about blockchain. Uh, if the Chinese government would use blockchain to achieve its social credit system, or if Google would use its blockchain, a uh, blockchain to do the same thing, but connect it with commercial banks. What's the difference, right? So the question really is, what kind of world do we want to live in? And how do we want to enable each other to collaborate in new ways so that we can take uh, a, a, uh, our society forward in the digital age? Right, so therefore, I'm also really, really uh, grateful that the Ministry of Interior Affair Affairs is uh, having two really important challenges this year. Um, our privacy is 
under attack each day. Your privacy is violated to sell you more stuff. We call it surveillance capitalism. Right? Do we want more of that? This year, more than 600,000 people quit Facebook in the Netherlands. That's a sign. That's a sign. It's just the start of it. But I would like to have an alternative as well, right? So that's what we're doing here, creating the alternatives, the better alternatives. And um, also when we look at digital identity, it's one of the keystone use cases, the keystone needs for a lot of other use cases we want to build, uh, and therefore it's extremely important that we work on it. It's each year, it's one of the most popular challenges. And so this is where we, can, where we think breakthroughs can, can come from. And um, when we look at uh, what I mentioned in the trailer, uh, in the creation of new markets, this morning uh, someone was mentioning uh, an example of uh, blockchain use in the food industry. Um, and then they called, uh, uh, they, they named Wal Walmart and IBM as an example. Well, same thing happens. One organization uses blockchain to streamline its own business. We take it from another point of view. If we create these open protocols that have no owner or where everybody can have ownership and where everybody can build on top of and use it in new types of applications and new types of products and services, then you unlock a new market. It's a grassroots ecosystem. It's a grassroots market. And we see it now, for example, with Ocean Protocol, which will be very interesting to dive further into uh, if, you, uh, if you're going to work on a privacy breach uh, detector, for example. They have a protocol in the commons. And we see already, because they just went live with their first uh, edition, that a lot of communities are start to pick it up and, and build on top of it already. And they don't need to pay Ocean for it. So that's, that's an interesting concept. So if you think you can create a solution and have everyone in the world buy it from you. That's what we used to do and that's where venture capital was trying to make money with Uber and stuff like that, but that's not really the model we envision here. However, on top of that, where you, where you uh, address the market, where you provide services, that's of course where, the, where a healthy competition would be quite good. Huh? So um, the challenges have been prepared in such a way that they are uh, a great entry point, I would say, in a interconnected but also decentralized context. And so there is a challenge that cannot be solved by one organization. It can only be solved through a network of organizations and of stakeholders. And especially in this case, civilians are the most important stakeholder, which need to be enabled to collectively contribute to what we think is a success for everyone. And um, then, of course, we uh <laughs> have teams. Um, so some of you have been to several deep dives already. Each deep dive, I get uh, a, new, uh, a new team picture. Uh, so uh <laughs> uh, the Scooby-Doo, thanks, Stefan. Um, so the teams uh, this year, uh, we see uh, something really interesting. Um, we had a lot, good, lot of good teams in the first year and also in the second year. But to be honest, and everybody knows, those years were also hype years. Right? It was, there was a lot of promise out there. And people love promises. So this year, what we see with the teams especially, because the, challenges, the challenge holders are al already on the same page, but also the teams, they are really driven to create this new type of infrastructure that serves complete ecosystems and networks and really see where the true potential of AI and blockchain can be and not just build something for the sake of blockchain or AI. So that's, that's a step further, uh, I would say, than, uh, than, uh, than last year. Um, a bit about the hackathon. Most of uh, the guests uh, last year we had over n uh, 900 and uh, somewhat uh, guests. Uh, most of them arrive on the Thursday. 
Uh, we have an incredible amount of uh, expertise joining us, helping all the teams uh, uh, the whole weekend. And uh, they give uh, 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 really cool masterclasses in an informal setting. So all the entrepreneurs in Groningen, of all, but a lot of entrepreneurs are opening their doors uh, for you uh, so that we can have the masterclasses. And of course, let's join for, uh, for a nice party, a welcoming party in, uh, in Groningen as well. Um, be careful for, uh, for our bar and nightlife because uh, Wouter's already nodding uh, because we, we, uh, we have no closing times. So um, the first uh, day of the actual hackathon on Friday, um, that's uh, the, the day of questioning, right? Uh, you will bring, no matter how well you are prepared, you will bring a big bag of assumptions with you and um, the more of these assumptions you incorporate in your prototype, the higher the chance of not winning, right? So uh, if, you, if you prepare um, your ass off and then you come to the hackathon and you, you crunch for all these hours and you don't ask questions to all the experts and to uh, uh, also the stakeholders of, of the challenge, that's one big missed opportunity. So the teams that win leverage all the knowledge out there. But especially in, this, uh, in these challenges, I already mentioned, the interconnectedness is really interesting. For example, yesterday we were deep diving at KLM. They want to have a biometric solution because they are building what they call a happy flow, right? Biometrics, ID, mm. yeah? So the other ministries, uh, Justice and Safety and... Uh, um, uh, the Ministry of, the, uh, of Finance are building an open protocol for digital permissions. Yeah? See where this is, go where this is going? So uh, uh, that's also one of the, actually a challenge to, to see where you can connect. Perhaps not on the prototype level, but if your concept <coughs> is, has, it, has this connectiveness, connectedness in it, the DNA of the, uh, of the prototype, then it will, be, uh, it will be cool. Um, and uh, on the Monday, also something special happens because all the solutions, it's nice and great what we all cr uh, create and the prize money is nice, but that's not what counts. It's what counts. What counts is what comes after the hackathon and what we will do with the solutions towards adoptions, right? so, uh, uh, adoption. So the whole blockchain game, I would say, the end game is all about adoption. And so you will think in your concept and prototype the best adoptable solution, of course, but this needs humans to adopt it. So what we will do is all the partners, they will invite their stakeholders, their key stakeholders, to meet the winning teams on Monday, right? And talk with the teams on how we can bring you forward towards potentially adoption. Well, team selection, what do we do? We look, of course, at the quality of the team, a minimum of five uh, uh, team members, maximum of six. Uh, um, we, don't, we, we don't only look at your uh, motivation and qualities you bring, but especially we look for the potential after the hackathon. So if you can include in your motivation what you want to do after the hackathon, uh, let's say, what if you would win? What would that mean for you? And what would that mean for, um, for uh, the partners and the stakeholders? What lift, lift something uh, up uh, on, on what kind of plans you, you might have? Uh, because that's, that's what we really value high. Um, oh, by the way, what we also do, uh, uh, when we meet a really good team already, um, we already confirm them, right? So in this week, we have confirmed already a couple of teams, uh, and we will pick up that pace after, uh, after this weekend. So, uh, now, well, this is the last uh, deep dive we have um, after the, uh, the program of, uh, of the ministry. Uh, we have uh, the, the pleasure uh, of presenting our own challenge. Uh, we eat our own dog food, so to say. So uh, uh, myself and Abe Scholte 
uh, will be presenting uh, the challenge of how we want to tokenize the ecosystem and basically make the digital commons economically viable. That's our mission. So um, I'm sure that this session will be fruitful, but you have to help with that by asking the right questions, by asking maybe even uncomfortable questions or tough questions, of course in a very constructive way, but now is the time to, to, uh, to really ask the challenge holders, what do they exactly mean? Why is this important to them? Of course they will present it, uh, but for you to connect with them, this is the big opportunity. So have a great session and uh, see, you, uh, see you at uh, the next break. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rutger. Thank you so much. Um, what I really love about this clip and this whole actually to watch a movie um, is that the things I work on every day, privacy, digital identity, um, this hackathon ecosystem makes it sound cool. Uh, while when I'm at a party at a Saturday evening, uh, most of my friends don't think it's very cool. So it makes, also makes me feel about, well, we're working on something which is very exciting. Okay, this for the introduction. Now we're gonna go with the things we came for the deep dive. Um, we're gonna go to the first speaker. I already got his name over here. He's from Evernim, and he came all the way from Madrid, I think, yes? And he is Alex Broekschat. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me well? All good? Excellent. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I love coming to the Netherlands. I've been many, many times. I even have family members here, so it's great to live in Rotterdam. So this is about myself. Um, I'm calling this Identity is the New Money because there's a really beautiful book that's um, from David Birch that I really recommend you to read, which is called Identity is the New Money. And basically, um, identity combines two other things that I'm really interested in that I've been working on for many years. One is money second one is blockchain, and the third one is identity. So the thesis of every, everything I'll be talking about will be a little bit about that. We've co coordinated a little bit with Paco because we are both Spanish, which is a coincidence. You, you have two Spanish guys coming today here for you. Um, and so I'll do more the higher level aspirational view of where I think identity will be going to, and Paco will do like more of a deep dive of a concrete use case. Um, my background is, is a little bit mixed. I'm kind of Spanish, German, Moroccan but I lived most of my life in Spain, so if you hear my German accent, it's because I went to the German school in Malaga. That's where I'm from. <laughs> so, um, before we go into identity, uh, some, some things I, I, I like to share, because um, uh, Rauch, he, he was saying it before, and I think, yes, the last two years, we had like, a big hype around blockchain, and, if, and this year, is, is, I think, it's much, much better. Um, I do a lot of meetups, and um, we just did one two days ago where 90 people popped up out of the blue for smart contracts, very basic. W and what I'm really seeing is that the quality of people is increasing a lot, and all the people that were just interested in making a quick buck, is, that's really disappearing. But independently of blockchain, I think we have a number of challenges that, that are really changing our society really quick. One is technology, all the exponential technologies, and blockchain is one of them. And the regulatory pressure is really increasing for everyone, so that's ma that makes everyday business more complicated. I mean, you have very advanced countries, maybe like the Netherlands, where things work maybe easier or better, but in countries like Spain, where I come from, it gets really, really complicated, all the stuff you have to deal with from a regulatory point of view. Digital natives, the demand is basically all the people spending all the time online, they're very demanding and they change really quick, and that's basically all of you. Um, and then you have all the new tech. New tech is like every, ev all those new companies um, trying to eat up the traditional businesses, and that's really reshaping the value chain. Um, and from my point of view, that really creates a situation, and uh, Rajas, who was mentioning that too right now, is that everyone becomes everyone else's competitor because everything is shaping up and changing so quick that we don't really know where we're going. Finally, monetary policy, I think it's a key thing, and it's one of the things um, I'll be talking about a little bit at the end when I talk about money too. Um, but monetary policy, the way it has been done, at least in the European Union for the last 10 years, with super low interest rates, it's, it's going, uh, will, will be going up again, but that has been also making life difficult for, if you talk about banks, insurances, anyone who's dealing with money, it has created a very difficult environment. 
But when we talk about identity, uh, most of the time, and I have only 15 minutes, usually I'd like to make it more interactive, but most of the time when you talk with people about identity, they say, oh, identity, yeah, that's my passport, or my driving license, whatever, that's my identity. And people identify with identity basically what, what they see as their bureaucratic identity. But when we think about it, identity in, in the bureaucratic sense, uh, like until 100 years ago, didn't really exist. When we had to travel in, the European, in Europe or the world, there were no borders. Maybe it was dangerous, but you didn't need a passport to travel around. And basically, for diplomatic, geopolitical reasons, they started creating these passports, and, and that's where this kind of bureaucratic identity came from. What we will be talking a little bit more about when we combine blockchain, identity, and money is about what it means in a broader sense, and that identity is much, much more, and it's everything I do in my everyday life. And since it's everything I do in my everyday life, we also need to protect that. Yeah, so that, that's paper, but um, I'm just not sure if this moves. Oh, okay, but the problem we have is that this really worked for, for the 20th century, but for the 21st century, um, since the world is digitalizing, and you have some really nice books, I was reading this a little bit, which I really recommend you to read, um, that's what I think is part of the future, and, and you're really fortunate to be in a country like the Netherlands where you kind of have this collective vision of what that means, but for the digital world, if we want to have something like a passport that is really issued by the government or any other type of credential, which is basically just saying, you can do this, you have the right to do this, and, it's, and this institutional person is saying that, we need something that is equivalent to that, but in a digital format. And that's not really existing today, um, and we were talking about it right now. If we depend on, on Facebook, Google, or so anyone, and I don't want to blame those companies, because if they have the opportunity, of course they have to take it up, but we as a society, we need to create systems for all of us where we can protect our privacy, and use those things in a decentralized way. And that's what I see blockchain and decentralization is all about. In our, in our company, um, Evanim, um, we've been thinking about this stuff for, for six years. I joined two years ago. Um, um, I've been in blockchain like for five years, but two years ago I started getting really, really interested in, in, in identity. And that's when I started working with Evanim. And Evanim had this vision um, to create decentralized digital identity. So the one of the first things they thought is, okay, all this technology we developed, let's create a foundation where all this technology will be donated to. And that's the Sovereign Foundation. And later on, the Sovereign Foundation contributed the code base to Hyperledger Indy. I'm just telling you this a little bit so you know the background because this is one of the high-profile projects in the identity space, I believe. Uh, I'm not saying it because I, I work with them. And, and this is basically the evolution. And it's not called Hyperledger Sovereign because for intellectual property reasons, they didn't want it to call, call it Hyperledger Sovereign. So Indy stands for independent. And it's one of the reference projects of Hyperledger. Um, and what we do is, is basically we take all those credentials, like passport credentials or any other type of credential that you can have, and put it on top of a decentralized system um, that allows you to share who you are and what you do in a very selective way that is privacy protecting, where you use zero knowledge proofs and other types of crypto exotic cryptography, basically to, to allow you to do that. Okay, and the vision a little bit about this is that at the same, and I really loved the beginning of the video where, where, you, where, where it said um, Bitcoin is part of the future. Where I come from in Spain, when you talk in, in a public space of the government, if you say Bitcoin, they start throwing tomatoes at you. So it's, it's, it was really nice to see that, that you have this open mind to, to consider all alternatives, because I think that's, that's really important. But in the same way that we see Bitcoin as a potential way of having a decentralized type of money, Ethereum as a decentralized application way, Division is that sovereign or other solutions, I think this is a really open way about how we approach it from, 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 from Evanim, is that we will have a future SSI protocol, that's how we call it, or open SSI world, where we have the internet of identity. And you will have many different systems fulfilling the needs of many different use cases or different people with, uh, for what they want to achieve. Um, Part of the companies that, that, are, that have been working this, that's um, by accident a little bit, but also um, that has been one of the big successes of Sovereign and Evanim, is that we have many big corporate players um, that have been collaborating this, on this. So you have some logos here. And um, Stefan, he told me when I came, he said, don't talk about blockchain because these guys, they know everything about blockchain. So I won't talk much about blockchain, but I'll just like to share this vision because it, w it is what will lead to the next slide. So when we take the blockchain stack, we have like the the infrastructure level, and then on top of that, we have all the other um, um, le 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 um, levels you can have. Um, this is basically, it all started with um, Bitcoin at the beginning. It has really evolved into this broader space where we want, where, where the vision of these people was to create a decentralized economy. And the things that has been feeding this vision of a decentralized economy 
has been very different to the way it has been done in the, in the, uh, in the DLT world. And, and to expose it is basically the people of this space, they usually want to see a decentralized economy that is creating this disruption in the same way it's being done in the Silicon Valley style. The type of money that where it has been coming from has been mainly coming from speculation because you had hardcore fan fanatics that believed very much in Bitcoin and never sold them. And, do and those values went up a lot over time. And, um, and very often, these people were people working, at least in the Spanish case or the South American case, which is where I s mostly work, is people working from nine to six at a company that hated their job and that nice that would work at open source projects and to create a decentralized world because they, they were not satisfied or they're not satisfied with how the world works today. And they invested that money into creating this kind of ecosystem. And that's what I call the public blockchain space. Okay. And then we have another word, which is the DOT word. Um, and, and the DOT word, as you know, is, is basically coming from corporates, usually with employees from corporates, and, um, and also the, the money is coming from the corporates too. And these two worlds have, have been in conflict a lot, I think over the last couple of years, but they're getting closer because the, the, the geeks and the nerds from the left side, from the public blockchain space, they, they see, okay, this is really nice that I'm doing all my nerdy stuff, but um, I need to have the normal people getting on this too. And the people on the right say, yeah, I need to have the geeks and nerds too because they're doing a lot of the interesting open source stuff. So these two worlds are coming slowly together and we will see from my point of view how that, how that shapes out. And this is just how this all works out. Like if you take something like Evan and Sovereign, it's really move, uh, on the top right where it's a permissioned network that has public access and, and, bit, and Bitcoin is like the pure permissionless and there are many, many different approaches to how this works in, in identity too. And, and, and this is a little bit, and I like to share this slide about how I personally see that. A and because a lot of people from my point of view, and I've struggled myself a lot with that, is don't recognize that a lot of the things about the choices we do about technology are representation of our view of the world. So if you're a DLT believer, that's how I call them, usually you trust the government, you tr trust institutions, you trust, every you trust the whole establishment of how it works today. And that's okay, there's no problem with that. But if you, if, you, if you have that vision of the world, then you will trust a DLT solution. You will say, oh, I don't have a problem with the permission system. I don't have a problem with that and that and that because it all works well. Um, and if you live in a country like the Netherlands, for the, for the time being at least, I, I th probably that's okay. But if you live in Venezuela, I'm not so sure. Um, so it really depends on the circumstances and, and, and where you are. And on the other end, um, you, you have the people that say, no, I don't trust centralized institutions. I want to decentralize the world because if we de decentralize power over information in the same way we're talking about it like for the Facebooks and Googles of the world, that, that will create a better world potentially because if, p if institutions don't have the power anymore over that information anymore, we can create a new world that is more fair. Potentially, it also has the risk of, p of becoming potentially much more dangerous from my point of view. So th this is, this, this, there's a whole spectrum of that. Um, I think the, the, the most decentralized solution we have today is Bitcoin. It's, that's on the cutting edge there, and it has been getting more centralized over time. And the, the reality of things is, is that creating decentralized so solutions is incredibly difficult. And there are many le levels of decentralization. So you cannot only say, oh, this is decentralized. No, what, on, on what level is it de decentralized? Is it ideologically decentralized, politically decentralized, technologically decentralized, logically decentralized? There are many, many different aspects about that. what that means. So you have all kind of grace in the middle here. And that's the really important question, I think, when we think about decentralization, is about to see, okay, where's decentralization really happening? Because the most decentralized system we have today is Bitcoin, and everything else in reality is below that. And it's not as decentralized. So, and since this becomes an ideological world very often where you have these guys saying you're wrong and these guys saying you are wrong, I don't think anyone is really wrong. It just really depends on your vision of the world. And your vision of the world, whatever it is, 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 is okay and it's right. But to establish this kind of communication and, and dialogue, I think it's important just to take this into consideration. And this basically is happening in the identity world too. In the identity world, we, we have all those flavors of, of identity where we'll have people say, oh, I have perfect decentralized identity. I think in most cases that's not really true today because it's incredibly difficult to achieve that. Uh, but yes, the vision of what we want to achieve is to get there at some point uh, in the future and we'll see which technologies work for you, which use cases. And now about money. Um, um, usually I love to ask questions about uh, what people think about money, but I don't know how, how well I'm doing on time. Um, I'm eight minutes, nice, good. And so then I would love to ask you two questions about money because I, I'll, I'll, I'll love to hear the, the answers. Um, 
when we think about money, um, I think it's very important. Um, I like to, I love to talk about it because I think our societies, they tend to put money like in a, in a pedestal and like very high, almost as, as if it were a god. And I don't believe it's, it's a god. The more you study monetary policy and how money works and where it's coming from, I think you just, it's just a tool for society to communicate with, that, with each other and, and transact. And, and, and that's the basics. But um, um, if you maybe, uh, my question for you is that when you think about money, why do you think when you go out in the shop outside here in, in The Hague, um, why, why do people accept your euros? Anyone has any idea or any suggestion why that works? Trust, I heard, right? Yeah, okay, what else do you think? Okay, okay, what else do you think? Okay, they trust the government too, yeah. Anyone else who has a su suggestion? Exactly. Alex, can I ask you to uh, throw the mic to the people that have questions in the room so the live stream people can hear it as well? Okay, I think we went through all the questions already, but sorry for not remembering to share, share the mic well. Anyway, these are the basic characteristics um, of money. You see them all there, that's the seven of them. And those characteristics, you, you said one of them already, uh, convert in functions. So basically, money needs to be a store of value, needs to be a medium of exchange, and also needs to be a unit of account. But everything starts really be by being a store of value, because if you have something that is store of value, that's good for you, because then you say, okay, I can hold this for some time, and I will be able to spend it in the future. Basically, you're avoiding um, current spending, and you're saving that for the future. But to do that, you need something that will keep its value over time. Uh, those are just the basics of money, just for, for at least from my point of view, to, 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 to share that quickly, because usually this discussion takes some more time. I think two of the key questions about why our money uh, why we trust our money when we go to the shop, um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, because it represents our, uh, the Euro Eurozone economy, because the central banks kind of with the monetary policy make sure that it kind of keeps it, its value over time and stuff like that. Um, but the, 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 the two key instruments about how the governments achieve or the central banks achieve that, from my point of view, that, that money um, um, can work as a tool, is the two tools. One is because it's legal tender. They make it the unique money, if there's a monopoly on money, when you go out to the shop, you cannot go out and say, oh, I want to pay with dollars, or I want to pay with, I don't know, with Argentinian pesos. No, no, you will have to pay with euros. B why? Because that's the legal tender. So that creates a demand for that type of money. And the second reason is also because you have to pay your taxes with that. Because the legal tender, when, you, when the tax authority of the Netherlands comes to you, you cannot go say, oh, you know what, I, I'm gonna, I made millions with my bitcoins, I'm gonna pay you with bitcoins. No, they will say, no, you're first gonna sell some of your bitcoins, and then you'd come with me and pay with yours because that's the legal tender. And all those instruments, they, crea they start creating uh, a wheel of demand for that type of money. And since there's no competition for any other type of money, that, that's basically the reference money. That's, from my point of view, how they create um, those tools. What, the, the way how this is related, and um, David Birch from, my, Birch, from my point of view, really describes this really well, is when you think about society, um, in our complex societies, we need these tools of money uh, the way we have it. Um, but if you imagine like the hunter-gatherers times, like a long time ago, they don't needed money because basically if you know everyone in your super small village of 30 people, you don't need money. Basically, you have an accounting system about how you interact with all each other and you know each other. And that's how this is related from my point of view to identity. Because basically when you know the people, you know the identity. You know he's related to this person, he usually doesn't, he, I invite him every Friday to lunch, he never invites me back to lunch. In my internal mental accounting, He's in debt with me, so I'm not inviting you anymore. You, you're like your bad payers. So in small system, that kind of, of works. And what is happening with identity, and that's from my point of view what, is, uh, what could be happening in the future, because since crypto or cryptocurrencies kind of fulfill all the characteristics of money, and we are unifying the identity world together with the um, crypto world over time, we might end up having a representation of the, hunt the hunter-gatherer times the way we had it um, um, thousands of years ago in a digital society. So th that's one of the hypothesis, hypothesis for the future. And from my point of view, the reason why we can do that is because uh, at, um, at least where I'm coming from, which is a com very conservative country, I like to um, think about it that way. This is the, w the universe represented since the Big Bang uh, in 12 months. And when you see the, since the Big Bang until today, 
basically in, that, in those 12 months, like one second ago, Christoph Columbus uh, did get to America. And this is something you can see in, in Cosmos on Netflix. They have a very beautiful series where they explain a lot of things about science. Um, and what I'm suggesting with that is that what the opportunity we have uh, with blockchain and all exponential technologies is basically to reshape the world we the way we know it. Because basically we can reinvent everything. Our lives are so short that we don't realize that everything we use today is, has been created at some point in the future just because technology evolved. And, and what is happening right now is everything is changing so quick that uh, the world we kno as we know it is dr changing dramatically. Um, give me two more minutes. That's why I, I think that we have a network world of 7 billion people, um, which is part of this decentralized economy, and identity is one of the fundamental aspects to make all that happen, and we will see how that shapes up over, over time. Um, if you want to read about decentralization, I really recommend you to read these books. These are very beautiful books, but I especially love this one, one for many, which is from the founder of Visa, who explains how decentralized systems wor work. Um, he published this in, in the year 2000. Um, I'm one of the founders of Blockchain España, which is one of the main communities in Spain um, about, about blockchain, and we do a lot of um, articles, pub, um, meetups, and all kinds of different stuff. I'm also one of the founders, together with Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Panama, Mexico, and Spain, of the Ibero-American Blockchain Alliance, where we try to push the same things. Um, four years ago, I published um, Bitcoin, The Hunt for Satoshi Nakamoto, which is um, kind of the first graphic novel about Bitcoin, which has been published to Russian, Korean, Brazilian and some other languages, English too, not in, a, not in Dutch yet, and also published this book about blockchain, which is kind of the reference book about blockchain in the Spanish-speaking world. In identity, um, if anyone here is involved in identity, I recommend you checking out SSI Meetup, which is something that we do in English um, to create a global SS, uh, SSI community. If anyone is interested in joining or um, talking one day, please um, get in touch with me. Also writing a book about decentralized digital identity that will be published by the end of, the, of this year by many people in the identity space. If you're interested in that, please reach out to me too. And I hope I fulfilled the time. And thank you very much for your attention. Wow, Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Wow. It's great to have people who really know what they're talking about and can go through this in a very short time. Um, after we had the speaker uh, next to this and the speaker from a minister, a ministry presenting the challenge, there's going to be a Q&A. So there's going to be more questions to ask. Um, three weeks ago, I was at a visit in London to a company and I was speaking about uh, their identity wallet. I had some time left, so I asked for them, uh, could I come there? And they invited me. And then during the meeting, they asked their CTO to come in the room. And I spoke to him and he spoke about this decentralized identity concept he was working on. Then I was like, oh, well, we got this blockchain hackathon in the Netherlands coming up, and you're working exactly on that. Can you come and speak at our deep dive about what you're doing? This is what happened, and um, now I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Paco from Yoti in London. Thank you so much. You're pointing in that direction. Thank you for having me here. It's great to be back to the Netherlands. Um, cause I, I used to live actually in Leiden 10 years ago. Um, I used to work for the European Space Agency. Um, one of the biggest challenges to me as a Spanish speaker in the Netherlands wasn't actually to launch staff into space, it was actually to tell people where I used to live, which is Cabo uh, de <laughs> So can I just begin with a question to all of you? Do you feel like you own your identity online? If you feel like you don't own your identity online, please raise your hand. Right, so that's pretty much everyone in, in the audience here. What if I told you that there is a way that you can truly own your identity online? A fundamental building block that will allow you to not only own your identi identifier, but also, you know, prove who you are, authenticate yourself online, offline, and it's absolutely in your control. There's no central authority, it's a distributed network, so there's no censorship, there's no one can basically can prevent you and take away that really, really valuable thing, which is your identity. So this is a bit of who we are, we're Yoti. Uh, you can look us up on the website, so I'm just going to 
skip through this and get to the uh, meat of this. So let me begin with a story. So Alice heard about this uh, amazing digital you know, video platform that now serves interactive uh, content and things like that. So she goes to this website, um, Videoflix, and the first thing she sees is this you know, username and password. Okay. So Alice tries her username, Alice, um, you know, just uh, fill in a password, one, two, three, four, five, six. Problem is that Alice is already taken by someone else, right? So Alice goes and then looks, okay, how else can I actually prove my identity online? Oh, I've got a Facebook account, great. So let's just go ahead and use that. So Alice goes and selects Facebook as her identity provider and then creates an account with the video flicks. What Alice doesn't know is that, you know, Later on, next day, she starts being targeted by, you know, some of the brilliant video platforms online, like, you know, Video Prime and things like that, which Alice actually that doesn't know where that comes from. So that's a bit of an issue. So if we take a, we take a step back, what's happening here? Alice is delegating her identity to one of these uh, blue chip uh, big identity providers. So she's pretty much like giving away control of that. Um, is putting a these people, these organizations into a place where they can have access to a lot of information in terms of the digital footprint of Alice online, right? So they know the type of websites that Alice visits and also whether she's got a bank account with a particular entity or maybe she joined a particular group, yeah, which is not great in terms of privacy for Alex, Alice. So is there a better way? Is there a way where Alice doesn't have to, you know, give away her privacy or give away control and delegate in all these uh, you know, blue chip organizations. So if you have a look at what's really happening here, because even to create your Facebook account or your Google account, you start with an identifier, right? So if you think about identifiers, you know, one of them could be your name, right, Paco? The problem is that that is not a global and unique identifier. Nobody owns that. In fact, there are so many packers in the world that it's you know, <laughs> impossible to get an account in any of these uh, you know, very well-known online services. So you go next to an email address, right? You've got a kind of a similar issue with the very well-known email providers. Um, it's global, it's unique, but the problem is, and the question is, do you really own that identifier or does someone else own it? So, you can think of you know, who owns that identifier as a hierarchy, where you're actually at the very bottom of that hierarchy yourself. Actually, the email provider owns that identifier. But is it the top of the hierarchy? No, actually the company that provides that service owns that identifier. And there's even you know, higher layers in terms of that hierarchy, in terms of the top level domain, and eventually at the top of the hierarchy, is the root DNS service. So there are 13 root DNS servers in the world. They're all controlled by the, pretty much uh, the US government, and actually the Department of Commerce is in control of you know, who are these top level domains, and you know, who is authorized to basically register them as DNS entries. If you take a very useful identifier, which is also global and unique, your phone number, you can think about, you know, okay, so I think I own my own phone number, but actually you don't. Your phone operator does, right? And we've seen cases actually in the cryptocurrency space where a uh, wallet has been stolen because uh, swing, seen swapping uh, processes where you basically go to the phone operator with a fake ID and say, yeah, actually I own that phone number. Please give me a sync copy of that. It's a bit of an issue. Um, on top of that, it's also the national regulator. Yeah, so in the case of UK, that's Ofcom. Uh, in the Netherlands is the, the Dutch Telecom Agency. So is there a way to have an identifier that you truly own, that there's no central authority that says, okay, you own that identifier, but happens in a distributed way with a consensus that agrees on that identifier, belongs to you, and is bound cryptographically to that particular entity. So this is a fundamental concept that came uh, up about you know, three years ago. Um, it was a piece of work sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security, actually. 
but the, the, the concept is, um, is that you create this distributed identifier that nobody owns. It's a string that represents the, the ID, then the method, and that's particular and specific to a, a, a blockchain system, right? So the method could be, for example, um, on Ethereum blockchain, it could, be, it could be on the Bitcoin blockchain, it could be on the Sovereign blockchain, or even the Libre blockchain, which is a project that we have in Joti. Um, after that, you've got that particular sequence of strings uh, that represents that identifier. Um, and then the, one of the fundamental uh, components of your DID, it's a key pair, right? So you publish the public key of that key pair, but you actually keep that private key safe, secure, in an identity wallet or a place that you, you, know, you actually trust that is gonna keep that private key uh, in a secure space. So uh, for example, at Yoti, we provide access to the secure elements so you can store that private cryptographic material secure. But it's your choice, right? So you could actually uh, you know, print a QR code with a private key, put it in a safe, or you know, under the pillow if you want. It's absolutely your choice. Uh, the standard doesn't dictate where you have to store that private key. And then the second element is the service endpoint. So, okay, I've got an identifier, but this is basically answering the question of how do I reach you? So, if you're in control of that private key, you are uh, pretty much authorized to update the service endpoint without having anyone or intermediate person or central authority to doing that for yourself, like is happening to do today with the um, uh, DNS systems or registrars. So you're in absolute control to update that and you don't depend on anyone. This is how a DID looks like according to the uh, W3C draft standard. Um, you can see in green highlighted the three elements that I've discussed, but also in yellow, uh, something which is important for consumer identity and also for organizations which are a bit you know, kind of smaller, medium, and don't have perhaps a very strong public key infrastructure in place. So that recovery method allows you to recover your DID. Yeah? Because one of the big, big benefits of DIDs is that there is continuity. So even if you lose your private key, you can delegate recovery to a particular entity, agency, or if you don't trust just one, you can actually set a quorum, say for example, two out of three of these trusted agencies need to be uh, basically authorized that recovery, that DID. DIDs are interoperable, so you know, there's no point of uh, Yoti coming up with one DID method or Sovereign or someone else. Actually, the standard allows you to interpret across different blockchain systems, right? So this is a project by the uh, Distributed Identity Foundation called the Universal Resolver. So that allows you to provide a DID and then that looks into the method, in this case Sovereign, but that could be, again, Ethereum, Bitcoin, or Libre, and that will allow you to resolve the service endpoint, the public keys, so you can actually interact with that particular DID. So how does the use case look like now with Alice registering her account in Videoflix? So instead of picking up a username or password or delegating to a third party identity provider, she provides her DID. Um, okay, Alice doesn't, she's not capable of memorizing this, but the identity wallets and the libraries basically, um, they, they, they move away all this complexity. So for her, the only thing that she will see is that's her Videoflix DID. Yeah? So this kind of pet name that represents that DID. Think about it like your agenda on your phone. You don't know the phone numbers from all your contacts, but you basically give them uh, names that you actually understand and have meaning for that. And then the way it works is that Videoflix doesn't have to contact the identity provider, goes and resolve that particular DID on that particular blockchain, and then brings back the public key and the authentication service endpoint. So the next step for Videoflix is basically to push a uh, challenge to that authentication service endpoint, and because Alice is in control of the private key. She can sign that challenge and then authenticate herself in the Bioflix platform with no intermediates or city, uh, central authorities involved. But what happens when Alice loses her form, right? It's a question that uh, you know, we found out very quickly at Joti when we started to work on digital identity. Like, you, know, you could have all these uh, great 
cryptographic driven digital identities, but in reality, people lose their form, organizations lo a lose access to private keys, so how can she recover? So if you remember the recovery endpoint, uh, basically she can instruct her um, recovery agency to recover that DID, and assign a new public key, in this case this purple public key for her particular DID. So what happens is that when VideoFleece goes to the blockchain and resolves that particular DID, they get not only block N, but also block N plus one, and they will see that you know, the purple public key is the one that is actually on the head of that particular blockchain and the one that is authorized to basically uh, authenticate that particular DID. So the process is pretty much the same, but uh, the blockchain is retrieving that purple public key instead of the green one, and then Alice is really happy because she can continue to watch her favorite TV series on Videoflix. But, you know, this DID is, is great, like it gives you all this uh, sovereignty in terms of you really control those identifiers, you don't depend on any central authority, but um, identity is way bigger than that, yeah? For identity, you actually need to provide context, you need to provide statement. Um, we call these verifiable claims, which is you know, a very simple definition because it's just a statement that you can verify cryptographically, right? Um, you can think about you know, your passport today, or driver's la license, even tickets or memberships to particular organizations, um, even uh, particular attributes that define uh, that person, like maybe, you know, plus 18 attribute, yeah, that can be issued as a verifiable claim, and that can be disclosed without giving away your full date of birth, yeah? So, how can you also use verifiable claims in such a system without compromising on privacy? Because, um, you know, today you could give a uh, certificate to someone, yeah, and then the, if you want to prove your identity, you have to give all of the information in that certificate, like, you know, today happens with your passport, driver's license, and things like that. Um, in this example here, we've got uh, four uh, particular issues, so a bank, government, an employer, and an email provider. So imagine that Alice has been watching too much video flicks, and now it's time to get a job. So she's got a government ID, bank ID, and an email provider. But the way that she interacts with these particular issues is leveraging on everything that we talk about, about DIDs. So she generates these private keys, yeah, and publishes these public keys and creates those four different DIDs. So A, B, C, and D, they are pretty much independent from the issuer perspective. So what she does is that she provides those DIDs to the different issues, and that way she manages to have um, achieve privacy so the bank doesn't know that that's her digital identity or persona, uh, for example, for that government or that employer or email provider. So what happens is that Alice starts collecting these verifiable claims and keeping them in her secure identity container. So that's something that she doesn't publish onto the blockchain, she doesn't give away to people, only she decides to disclose attributes of those verifiable claims as she needs to, right? So the way it works is that she may be taking uh, her um, nationality coming from the government as an issue because that's important to prove that you know, she's Dutch when she wants to you know, find a job somewhere in Europe. Um, she can get also the bank account number coming from the bank yeah, because she wants to get paid. And also an email provider so the employer can also contact her. So she produces this... Um, zero knowledge proof disclosure that takes all these different attributes and provide proof to her employer that you know, these are uh, her identity attributes and they come from all these different issues. And the employer can verify that with cryptography. Yeah, it doesn't need to trust a particular uh, entity, but basically goes to a blockchain, resolves the public key of the issues and can verify that cryptographically. And the analyst uh, basically can reuse and produce new proof of uh, disclosure as she sees fit. She sees fit, um, you know, have to disclose elements of attribute with other uh, service providers. So we're talking about DIDs, which is the uh, pretty much gives you this interoperability layer, allows you to have the fundamental uh, building block, which is your distributed identifier. 
Then you've got this verifiable claims, which is basically extending that and giving uh, you know, a, a meaning, context, um, a way to basically prove generic statements of that particular person. But everything we talk until now is connected to private keys. Yeah? And there's nothing stopping me from basically sharing that and colluding with someone and giving my private key to someone else. So that's where the third level, which is biometrics, come into place. Yeah? Biometrics actually link private keys and verifiable claims to individuals. Yeah? So that's really important because uh, when I want to prove, for example, that I'm already team because I want to buy a bottle of wine, the system should prevent me from sharing that with my smaller brother yeah? and him basically going and get some bottle of wine from the supermarket. Um, at JOT, we've developed all these different technologies in terms of you know, facial recognition, speaker identification that will allow uh, companies, startups, to build concepts around how you prove your identity with multi-factor and multi-model biometrics. Um, and if you allow me just one piece of advice for the hackathon, please don't write biometrics onto the blockchain. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, if you're going to do that, come and talk to me. Or if you want to know anything more about our Libre ID or biometric platform, uh, happy to uh, you know, answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paco. Um, it's incredible to see people speaking about identity at this level. For me, this is really looking at, uh, let's say, a very beautiful Netflix movie, what it's like for kids. Um, we're going to go to the challenge we're posing as the Ministry of the Interior. Um, and for that, I would like to invite my colleague Hans-Rob de Reus over here. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'd like to introduce you our first challenge about uh, next generation uh, EID. Um, okay. In simple terms, our ambition is that all citizens in, Hel in Holland are able to prove their identity or deliver attributes about their identity um, on the internet to the government, but also in, as, a, as a consumer to the business. That's C to G and C to B. Our main focus from the ministry is C to government, but we invite you to also make solutions to make use of it in a broader sense as a C to B. Um, this is the text on the website about the challenge, very long sentences. So I can imagine that there are still a lot of questions what the challenge is all about. So let me skip this sheet and let me explain more simple terms. In a nutshell, we ask you to develop an app that delivers attributes, but for the government, one special attribute, it's called BSN, Burger Service Number, Citizen Service Number, Social Security Number, that kind of number, because in Holland we are organized today, maybe in 20 years, not so, but today, when you want, want to do um, services, e-government e services in Holland, all those back offices are organized through one centralized social security number, BSN. So in essence, when you want to do business with the government on the internet, the only one attribute you have to provide is the BSN. Um, for the C2B, there can be a lot of other attributes. Because when you provide your BSN to the government, then we know all the other attributes we have stored them in our centralized databases. I'll show you later on. Um, in Holland, we have about 13.5 million active citizens who use uh, e-government services. That's, uh, we, our total population is 70 million. A lot of people use e-government services. Um, there's one major challenge that the solution has to um, has to prove that it is um, uh, uh, according to the rules of EIDA substantial. The level of trust is very important in this solution. That's, I think, where the challenge is. But let me paint you the, the, the level playing field in Holland. How is the situation organized? So where can you build on? At first, in Holland, we had a situation that all the municipalities, the, 
you have, when you live in Holland, you have to go to a municipality and you, have, um, you will be registered in a centralized database. So in Holland, we have one big database where all our citizens are registered with a BSN number. Just your bureaucratic, your administrative, administrative identity is that BSN. Uh, your date of birth, your, uh, 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 where you live, etc., is also stored. Second part is that that municipality proves your uh, physical identity document, so you can show you in the real uh, world who you are. We have three kinds of identity documents, driver's license, identity card, and a passport. The same data stored in, some of the same data and stored in the central database is also in the uh, document. I'll show you later. A third part is that there are 13 and a half million Dutch people, they use a login service from the government. It's called DigiDay. It's already uh, in about eight, nine years in place. It consists of a username and a password. So it's a, a very basic um, login service. And we're looking for a next step of a level of assurance, substantial. But when you use, this all those Dutch people use DigiDay, when you use it, it delivers the BSN to the government. That's, that's the, the mainstream, how you log into the governmental services. And the last part is that in Holland, from the age 12, 12 years and older, 92% uh, uh, of the Dutch people uh, have a smartphone. This is a very big uh, part of the Holland population has a smartphone. So we think when we deliver an app working on any smartphone, we have a broad reach for the citizens. So we have four, um, let's say, assets in place which you can use in building the solution. So you can use in your solution the centralized database with those data available. You can also, also uh, we will deliver some specimen smart cards for the challenge, driver's license and ID cards. Those smart cards, they have a chip in it, this is a contactless NFC chip, so you can read through NFC, NFC, you can read the data stored in those smart cards. Um, you can also use a DigiDay, a DigiDay account for test purposes, delivering a BSN on a low, uh, basic level of assurance, and you have to bring your own smartphone and maybe the most important thing, number five, is the citizens itself, his, his biometric appearance. That's what we can give you. But what's the, the real challenge? The real challenge is in the onboarding process. Not making an app, storing attributes, delivering the attributes to a service provider. That's not the challenge. The challenge is in the enrollment phase the onboarding of the citizen in the app on a level of assurance substantial. Why is it changed? Because when you look at the regulations of IIDIS substantial, it says that when you enroll this, this, uh, the, the citizen, you have to check his identity on a strong level. You have to prove that when you, uh, that, that you match the real person in life with the reali reliable source identity document, the database from the government. So you have to make a connection between the real life person and the identity, the BSN stored in the app. The simple solution is to ask every Dutchman to go to the municipality, bring in his passport and show him to the municipality uh, 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 guy who he is. But that's not the solution we want because that's a very uh, expensive solution. Uh, so you have to go to the, to the municipality what you want to achieve is that the, enrol the enrollment, the, the, the process, can be as a self-service process, preferable from home. So as a citizen, I can use the app, enroll you in enrollment as a self-service in the home situation. So, but when we don't see that guy, that citizen, how do we know that there's not identity theft, there's no identity mixed up, how do we know for sure that when he uses that app, which is BSN or other attributes, that is that person binding to that app? <coughs> That's a challenge. 
using, it, using the app, there are many different uh, solutions, therefore, that's not a problem. It's the first phase. Um, the homework you have to do is uh, fight through all those papers from IATIS, the regulations. It's a very heavy uh, uh, set of uh, uh, guidelines, rules. The most important one is in the enrollment phase, I highlighted that. Uh, the rules they explain about what uh, uh, demands there are in the enrollment phase. Um, suggested use cases. Well, the first one is obvious, the initial onboarding, getting the BSN attribute loaded in the app with that security level. The second one is using the app, providing the BSN, or using it as a, in, in a B2, uh, uh, C2B uh, environment, whatever. Um, what I forgot to mention is also that privacy by design is, needless to say, a very big issue. So I didn't even mention it because I know, oh, no, you take it with you uh, for as well. Um, and third, use case also may be difficult. I have installed the app, I'm using it, and I buy a new phone. How do I transfer the enrollment to my new phone? So, that's the challenge. <laughs> Very good to see that we're, I think, even though I'm a colleague of Hansrop, that we're really advancing in knowing what we want to have as a challenge for the hackathon. We're not just asking, hey, come up with a digital identity. We really thought this through. But now we're going to put this to a test. Um, at the hackathon, there will also be experts, like people yeah. with legal knowledge, people with technical knowledge, people with... Uh, governmental registry knowledge, AIDIS uh, knowledge, AIDIS experts, yep. uh, Hans Rob, uh, of course. <laughs> um, but for now, let's go to someone in the room who has a question about this challenge to clarify it and get it more clear. And the only thing I want to say about that is, let a question please be a question and not a statement. Sometimes people mix this up. Um, let's let's. You were the first one to to signal your hand. I'm going to throw this at you so the people who are listening with us on the internet can also hear what you're saying. I hope no one gets hurt. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, Speak in the microphone. Yes, I have a technical question. So when you read the uh, NFC chip from your passport, is it able to sign uh, a challenge? Um, is your passport able to sign a challenge? What do you mean by cha oh, the challenge from the, from the challenge to the chip? Yeah, mm. yeah, so you send something to the chip, yeah. you, you request some information, and then the chip signs your request. Yeah, Back. it yeah. delivers the, the, the data as a reli reliable uh, data from the chip. That's what you mean? It's not a no. PKI certified uh, signature, I don't think that, that's it. But uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's only one way, you cannot send something oh, no, no, to no, the no, chip. No, 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 it's just one way. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's a closed chip, you cannot write data on the chip or something like that, no. Okay, thank you. No. Okay, no thank way. you. I think there was a question over here as well. Can you throw the thingy? Uh, well, pass it on yeah. so no one's get, no one's get hurt. Um, so um, a lot of people go to the municipality to get a driver license or passport once every five and, years. and once every ten years if you're older. Um, 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 what is the penetration grade of all the Dutch people going to the municipalities to get that? Is it everybody? Yeah. In Holland, everybody has to have either an uh, identity card or passport or a driver's license because you have to show your identity to, to, the, to the officers. So everyone in Holland has some kind of uh, smart card of passport, is NFC. Uh, they are valid for 10 years. So um, when we want to, um, this only once in 10 years, what, what, uh, someone goes to the municipality and that's not uh, often enough for this problem. We want to. Our solution, we, we aim that in, in between now and two years, we have a working solution ready for all those people in Holland. It's not too far in the future, now in two years. Thank you. Is there some, oh yeah, the hands are popping up. Okay, there you go, sir. Yep. Speak in the microphone, the, please. Yes, I actually have questions. Uh, first question is uh, regarding situation when uh, somebody loses his uh, digital device. What? exactly do you expect to see? That's what? That his identity is still be uh, protected. 
su success. Okay. <laughs> so it means that no, this, it has to uh, pin code or whatever. It, it has to be. Uh, uh, has to bind, bind it with something he knows, not only what he has. Okay, fine. And another question, what about situation when somehow his secret was stolen and his identity was used from another place? Yeah. Does this, this situation... Just normal out when your passport is stolen, it can be used as well. Yeah. yeah. Photo replaced in my passport, in yeah. physical passport, but here we yeah. are speaking about digital devices when hackers can steal any secret information, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. So is this situation somehow sh must be regulated from the yeah. point of view, yeah. protected? Yeah. It would be nice that if you, that, that you were alerted somehow that if, you, with, if there is a misuse if, from your identity, that's step, uh, one step. And the second step, there would be some kind of red button you can push and uh, block your uh, 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 your app, so you have to build nice. in. Yeah. Yeah. Answer okay. everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you throw the microphone to the guy over there? Please be careful. Yeah. Um, so I have. A Please speak in the microphone. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I have a bit of a technical question. Um, the you provide identities. Uh, do you also provide the um, technique to read from the identities? Because I was looking into the technique. So uh, there's yeah. smart card readers. I suppose uh, there might be some, some technical guidelines how to use the how to read the NFC uh, uh, chip. Yeah, because yeah, there is some restriction. I was reading reading about the uh, chips. I will dive into that and publish okay. it on the on the website okay. probably. I and think I can. Can we also get how the fingerprints are scanned? No, fingerprints are <laughs> not part of uh, <laughs> the solution. No. No, but they are on the NFC chip. NF no, the photo, not not fingerprints. Okay, the website from the ministry says it's only on passport. Oh, only on the passport, only in passport. Okay. not on the identity card and not on the driver's license. Okay. But we're not allowed to use the fingerprints from passport. That's for another purpose. Okay, good to know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can you pass it on over there and then we we'll go to the back? Yes, yeah. please. So, just a question. Uh, normally, if you are in an RFP procedure... Please, with, with please speak a little louder. It, normally, we, when we are in an RFP procedure, there are all those lines and we have to be in the box, but it's also possible for the challenge, because you are very specific of what you want to take outside of the box, yeah. if, it is an, if it is an equal good solution, um, maybe even better. Yeah, any solution that's designed as a self-service enrollment process, working on any smartphone, uh, and, and uh, accordingly to the IIDA substantial level, is good. Okay. That's the only uh, the only boundaries. Okay, the box is already a bit bigger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was someone in the back. Can you throw it over there yeah, without talk. hurting too many people? <coughs> Very nice. Please speak loud. Uh, serious question. Uh, hasn't this challenge been solved by banks who have an online onboarding process now? And shouldn't this challenge be posed to normal fintech solution providers instead of a blockchain audience? Yeah, I, I see some kind of solutions. In Holland, um, the majority of the banks, they still rely on that you have to go to their offices one time in, in, uh, for opening a, a large account. Um, the Bung Bank has developed a new way for making a selfie, etc. That's a very interesting uh, development. So I, I encourage you to look into that kind of solutions. But then the second question, the challenge, shouldn't, shouldn't this message be spread to normal fintech solution providers? Because there's no actual blockchain aspect in it. Can be, but doesn't require it. Um, I think um, the, the basic role of the government is providing for the, the, the total of the, the economy and, and, and the citizenship, the municipalities, the role of the government is providing your basic, uh, uh, your basic identity. It's the, that's the role of the government. Not the banks, not fintech. That's our role. That they can, the fintech can elaborate on the basic service we can provide. We can, uh, in, 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 in the comments as well, we can state what your basic identity is. And you can use that, reuse that in other propositions. A lot of times, the passport or the identity card is used as a basic identity proof. That's, that's our role. So we want to find an digital equivalent of that role, so you can use it online in a self-service uh, environment. 
Okay, thank we you. don't disagree. But okay. Do I think there's two more questions, and then we're going to go towards a break because there's a lot of things to cope with. Um, mm -hmm. Stefan. Thank you. So, um, can you tell us something about the potential of this uh, challenge? Um, if you design this enrollment process, can and you, as a ministry, kind of back it. You are saying this is okay for us to use. Mm -hmm. Then, can the solution also be used somewhere else? Uh, now, first of all, um, our, uh, our current situation is that all our citizens, they have the 13 and a half million people, they use uh, a username a, a password as a login mechanism. That we want to change as soon as possible to a higher level. So our first step is, as soon as we can, bring onboarding those 13 and a half million people to a level of security substantial. That's our main goal. So the potential is quite big in Holland, all, 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 all Dutch citizens. And in, in Europe? Um, when uh, the I address regulation also states that when uh, a country, for example, in Holland we have a DJ substantial maybe, then we can, um, then you can use it in other countries in Europe. So I live in Holland and I want to uh, have some uh, 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 income in Belgium. I can use my Dutch device logging in to Belgium. I have to notify, the Dutch government has to notify its uh, uh, in-log uh, authentication mechanism to the uh, European Commission. And all the European countries have to accept the Dutch authentication me mechanism. It also works all, uh, all around. In Holland we have to accept German ID card. Thank you. Okay, okay, so the potential is Europe. That's what we, uh, <laughs> Thank say. you. Um, I think there was a, one last question over here. Yeah, yeah, uh, be here. careful where you throw it. Okay, we're going to... End at the front. <laughs> end at the front. Okay, this was uh, what I was afraid of. Okay, nobody heard. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, the SIM numbers uh, can be used as an immobile e signature. And is it possible uh, to issue the SIM numbers, not by mobile operators, but one organization, maybe you, DJID, that have the capacity to uh, identify a person beforehand, then the, sim, the same SIM number is attached to uh, mobile operators uh, services. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we will have uh, the hardware in our cell phone, which is basically we have, but we will, uh, modify its functionality bit because eventually we need to have somehow relationship with uh, uh, with uh, the hardware yeah. or something like yeah. this is it possible to produce it by one organization with the embedded capacity of its immobile signature yeah it sounds like an interesting id i invite you to put that in the, ch in the challenge okay it's your id sounds it good <laughs> yeah i practiced no <laughs> There you go, sir. Our last uh, question before, before we go to a break, and I encourage everybody also to look up the people who work on this challenge and ask more questions during the break. Yes, sir. I, have, I have two questions. One, has it to be blockchain related? No. Because, uh, because I know solutions which, which are AIDAS 4 compliant and work, uh, yeah. as you uh, said. We have stated it by preferably open source. Okay, should be open source. Okay. Preferably. And the uh, second question is, what is the definition of self-service? Um, that's a good question. Um, Self-service, in a way, um, um, that someone can be... Uh, uh, the first obvious one is that I can do it by myself, but it's also allowed that someone helps me. Uh, my mother is, is uh, 88, can I help her in the room? I think so, yes. But how do you make sure that she was not put under pressure yeah, with a gun in the head to do the enrollment. So that's uh, 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 difficult. But in, in the home situation, or maybe at a, a, a library, people want to, uh, to help over there, that's also possible. But in the end, you have to know for, su for sure that the person who wants to enroll, uh, once it, uh, it states, I want this. But there may be organized some help around her or him. Okay, thank you Hans Rob for this extensive okay. explanation of our challenge. There's also a channel 
on the uh, Odyssey website where we're actively participating to answer questions from possible uh, uh, teams. So teams who are interested in enrolling, you can permanently ask your questions on this challenge and there are people working for a ministry who are participating there in an open discussion to answer uh, questions we, we might have. And now after this one and a half hour sit, we're going to have a cup of coffee for 20 minutes uh, to be back to talk about open data and privacy. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you.
Yeah, I know, I know. Now it's, it's getting turned on, I think. Could I ask everybody to take a seat again? Please do. I know it's Friday afternoon and you're all longing for things which have to do with uh, liquid stuff and family. Um, but we've got very interesting things to come. Um, please do remember everything we said about digital identity and the large questions we have around those kind of topics. But we're moving on. And first we're going to dive deep into a subject. Then we're going to come to the challenge we're posing to the hackathon regarding this subject. And we're going to talk about something very interesting, which is something I love, which is open data and the GDPR. And we've invited our friend Silvan Jongerius to give us a deep dive into this topic. Please welcome Silvan Jongerius. Good afternoon. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm here to talk about open data, data sharing under the GDPR, and this is one of the uh, subjects that we deal with quite a bit um, for Tech GDPR, which is a boutique consultancy that I run in Berlin. Um, we do uh, actually only GDPR for deep tech. Now, one of the recent things that we worked on is a privacy report or a GDPR compliance report for a company called Zcash Cryptocurrency, and I thought it was interesting to highlight. Also because that was uh, last week featured on Forbes, uh, something I'm slightly proud of. Um, and the other thing that I'm involved in, and you may recognize this gentleman who happens to be the Secretary of State of this very ministry. Um, so the other thing I'm, I'm involved in is BearChain, is connecting uh, blockchain companies in Berlin and promoting that outside of Berlin. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, as uh, Redger men mentioned this morning, that um, that Raymond Knops was also at the, uh, the hackathon last, last year. So that kind of like completes the circle for me and I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but of course I'm here to, to talk about open data and data sharing under the GDPR. Now the first thing that you should probably realize is that the regulators uh, with regard to GDPR have a very um, almost extreme point of view. So the European, European Data Protection Supervisor uh, said in 2017 that there might well be a market for personal data, just uh, like there is tragically a market for live human organs, but it does not mean we can or should give that market the blessing of legislation. And I think that puts you in the right mindset, right? Um, what, is, what is the whole thing about personal data and should we be monetizing this? Um, and also with the GDPR specifically, there are very harsh fines for, for violations of it. So. Just to recap, you, you probably all heard about this, but there's up to a 20 million euro fine or 4% of your annual worldwide group turnover, uh, whichever is higher. So for Google, that can definitely go up. And Google was fined two weeks ago with uh, 50 million euros. Um, but there, there are other aspects to it. And one of them is the mandatory disclosure, which can certainly harm your reputation. And you can also receive an order to stop processing data and for a data company that is a company that sentence. Uh, the GDPR is built on, on a number of basic principles, uh, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Uh, you need to be handling data in a lawful way, in a fair way, in a transparent way, uh, with a limited purpose. So it is not no longer possible to just keep collecting data for whatever purpose and figure out what you do with it later, which was very popular a year, like, like eight or 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's very important to only collect the data that you need for a specific purpose, um, so data minimization. It needs to be accurate data. You need to have a limitation on the storage period. You can't just keep it forever until you figure out what you want to do with it. Um, and the data needs to be um, uh, stored or processed uh, under the principle of integrity and confidentiality. <laughs> and you're going to be held accountable for it if you're, if you're collecting data. Right? And the whole GDPR is a risk-based approach. That means there are no specific um, requirements such as use 256-bit encryption or, or store it for three years, but for every processing activity that, that you or a company involves in, they need to, need to think about, okay, what is actually the, um, the risk of processing this data and what technical and organizational measures such as encryption and a lock on the door do you actually use? So there's a lot of responsibility uh, if you're processing data. The scope of the GDPR is data of natural persons within the EU. Um, 
So this is people in the EU, not, which is a common misconception, residents or citizens of the, of the EU, but it's really about people that are physically on European soil. It's about personal data, not anonymized data, and not about data for household use. So if you want to write your Christmas cards, you can still do that. Um, but what I find interesting is, is, um, is to talk a little bit about the privacy and inf information asymmetry. So right now, if we're, if we're looking at the world, we have the corporations and the government that holds a lot of data about us. And on the contrary, we as individuals or startups, we, we perhaps don't even know who the person is that is actually responsible for the company. So there's this big information asymmetry. They know a lot about us, but we don't know a lot about them. And open data makes it a lot better. So by sharing certain critical data points or, or information about uh, what, you're actually, what is actually going on in the world around you, you have a little bit more of an advantage over those big companies that have been working with data since, uh, since ages. Basically, slightly balancing this scale and, and slightly making this world a, a better place. So I'm a big supporter of that, obviously. Um, but then if you're storing, or sorry, if you're sharing data, if you're looking at open data, you're, you're eventually you'll end up with very large data sets. There's a lot of data, and perhaps different uh, government institutions share their data. And it is not so much about this one data set, right? But, uh, but there, 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 it, it, there may be a situation where, there's, where there are three or four different data sets that's, that could be combined, and you may be able to find behavioral patterns in <coughs> such data. Um, again, but perhaps between one data set, but also between other data sets, which is part of the difficulty. Right? So how, um, how are you going to ensure that, that um, with the data that's being shared, there's actually um, no big risk of those uh, combinations to be made, and therefore um, personal data surfacing from those data sets. And, and if you think about it, so when does something become personal data? Right. Um, and that's actually, am I missing a slide here? Perhaps I'm not missing a slide. Anyway, example, um, if, I, if I go to the bakery as my routine every, f every Friday morning, and I buy a bread with my payment card, a credit card, or a pin pass, um, and then right afterwards, every Friday morning, I go to the cafe and I, and I basically I, I, I get a coffee and perhaps something else, right? I do that every Friday morning. With those data points alone, without knowing who I am, um, it is possible to identify me by simply standing outside of the bakery and saying, okay, who is here consistently every Friday morning and then walks in the direction of the cafe. So when does something become personal data? If you're able to single out one person, right? Um, another example, if, if uh, I'm, I'm for for perhaps I'm talking about uh, someone who is a manager at KPN. There are probably hundreds of managers in, in a company like KPN, right? So that doesn't constitute personal data. But if I'm talking about the managing partner of TechGDPR, which is a fairly small company, there's only one of them. So that would then constitute personal data, just to put it in perspective. Um, a personal data breach under the GDPR uh, is a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of, or access to personal data transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. So it's not, about, not only about uh, information leaking out, right? It's also if it's, if it's accidentally uh, destroyed, for example, um, or if it's accidentally altered, that's also considered <coughs> a privacy breach or a personal data breach in the terminology of the GDPR. Um, and then under breaches and notifications in the GDPR, um, it is if there's a risk to the, to the freedom and, and the rights of a natural person, it is required to notify, to notify the authorities within 72 hours. And as a sideline, didn't put this in the slide, after 72 hours of finding out, right? Just if you think about the challenges, may be interesting. Um, if there's a high risk to the privacy and the rights of an individual, uh, you also need to notify the affected data subject. And this is actually um, one, of the, one, of, one of those points where you really go against the risk of reputational damage. If the data was leaked of, uh, I don't know, an 80,000 uh, visitors of a certain trade show, um, and, and you need to notify all of them that you haven't been careful with their data, will they come back the year after? 
So I think it's quite clear that open data should be anonymized, should be quite, quite, um, quite obvious. Um, and if you want to learn more about um, anonymization versus pseudonymization, there's a link in here, but uh, probably if you, if you Google for WP216, you'll find it as well. This is the opinion of the Working Party 29, uh, which was the former authorities of data protection in Europe, and they've written a 36-page document about anonymization versus pseudonymization. What it also indicates is that that barrier is very high. It is not very easy to, um, to truly anonymize data because you may always have some of these data points left that can be recombined. And even though de-anonymization is, is very, very illegal and punish punishable with big fines under the GDPR, if you have the risk of this happening, you still want to be very, very careful with it. Um, so a little bit about personal data and blockchain. I think uh, one of the main things that you should think about, well, uh, the right to erasure and rectification, which probably everyone, especially in the area of privacy and blockchain has, has heard of, um, is very, very difficult in a, on an um, immutable ledger. So to start with, I would really think about um, or, or basically ensure not to store any personal data on a blockchain directly. <laughs> but um, if it's not personal data directly or unencrypted, then what about encrypted on-chain personal data? And also that is where the GDPR or the regulators see encryption as a technical measure to protect data, but it's not a way of moving it out of scope of the GDPR. So this is still in scope of, of the GDPR. It still needs to be handled as personal data, and therefore you also need to be able to let people exercise this right to be forgotten. Right? Um, and encryption can be broken in the future, quantum computing is coming up, so all these kind of considerations, you don't want to have these kind of things on an immutable ledger. But what about hashes? That's one-way encryption. I don't think I have to explain this to, to this audience, but, but if there is a, um, a hash stored on the, on, the, on the blockchain, that may also give some pointers to information and behavioral patterns. So for example, if I take my data from my passport, which is originally Dutch, not Latvian, but for sake of example, take that and make a hash out of it and store that on the blockchain, um, the question is what's, what's gonna happen with that? Is that personal data? And the answer is yes, it is personal data for the main reason that if someone would get my passport and the hashing algorithm, they could recreate this hash and therefore figure out my behavioral patterns on the blockchain, on an immutable ledger where we don't want them. Um, so then looking at the challenge, so what are some of the possible approaches to, to, to solving the challenge? Um, and, and I know the challenge <coughs> will be explained in more detail later, but I wanted to give you some food for thought about which direction you could think of, right? First of all, blockchain. It's not the easiest, um, and, and some things have been named already. I think self-sovereign identity is, is one of those points where you could definitely um, look at for, for certain solutions in this, in this realm. Um, if you think about immutable records and keeping log files, uh, for example, of, of uh, who has had access to certain data sets or um, who has uh, dealt with certain <laughs> algorithms, certainly interesting. Um, you can give back control over one's own data using blockchain technology. Um, you can enable marketplaces, look at Ocean Protocol, for example. Um, enable secure execution and, and rewarding people in a way that is not run with a central authority. I think that's one of the other opportunities of blockchain. Um, finding patterns, not specifically in, in blockchain, but if we look at data sets, uh, we may want to have a look at, okay, which kind of pattern is actually something that is, uh, that is closely related to personal data or is with a high likeliness personal data. Um, looking at relationships as well, it's like, okay, if, if, like what if we take multiple data sets and try to build relations between them, will we, will we be successful with that and will that uh, constitute or possibly constitute personal data? And one of the things to think about is also, um, uh, perhaps from the data itself is very difficult, but if you try to map that onto the real world, it becomes a lot more interesting. If we look at GPS coordinates, is that per personal data? Well, not, by, not per se. But if these GPS coordina coordinates may resemble the movement patterns of a typical human being, then there's a high likeliness that they will be. 
in, in general, using blockchain technology, decentralizing information, splitting it up over, over different areas where there may be different parts living in different uh, locations where you may need to do some extra effort or may not be able to do um, to basically link this back up. Maybe you know, an, another interesting approach to, to this challenge. Um, and what I find very interesting personally is also synthesized data sets. So where basically a data set is being used as input uh, for a algorithm that basically recreates a fake data set with the same characteristics as the original data set. This is something that I find extremely interesting uh, as an approach because for certain use cases this can, this can well be used. This may definitely be a possibility. Um, zero knowledge proofs in general, um, proving that certain facts are true or not true um, by n without seeing the data perhaps executed somewhere else um, is, is something that I find interesting. And I'd like to close with uh, a thought that is not mine, um, but Trent McConnery of Ocean Protocol, um, in, also in his, in his talk that he did last Monday, said like, well, we don't want to bring the data to the AI, but we want to bring the AI to the data. That's it. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you so much, Sylvan, for this uh, deep dive into open data and GDPR. I think we're going to proceed towards our challenge. Perfect. Um, and for that, I'm going to ask uh, one of my colleagues, who is very recognizable when he speaks about a topic, uh, to the stage um, to present his slides. Are, gonna, are they going to be there? Yes. OK. Um, please give a warm welcome to Paul Suikerbach. Thank you very much. Um, I'm proud to be here, and um, it, it's great to, to share my challenge uh, with you. Although it's not my challenge, it's our challenge, because uh, we're heading for a future where more data will become available of all of us, and a uh, combination of data uh, will be uh, a, a real problem. As been pointed out by Sylvan uh, already, thank you very much for your introduction. It was uh, fruitful for, uh, for me to go on with. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of text on the side, I will make it somewhat simpler. Uh, and the simple thing is that you, as, as a government organization, uh, we are very much in uh, collecting data and sharing this data as open <coughs> data. Having more open data uh, means that this data can also be combined in all kinds of ways. And during the, the 10 years that I've been working on uh, making more data available as open data. Uh, many times I came across the fact that a government organization said, uh, we are afraid of publishing this information because we are afraid of sharing uh, some personal information and that we have a privacy breach and we don't want to do that. And even with the coming of the GDPR, this knowledge became even stronger. The urge of doing this very good became stronger. So if we can point out the challenge very in a very simple uh, perspective, then the fact is that uh, adding data to the open community might bring you uh, a, a challenge in, in, in the fact that it might uh, uncover pr personal information. So the challenge is there that if you add, uh, I, I foresee a system or a service or a box or something which is up to you to invent or uh, with your innovative ideas, ideas to come up with, is a system or something that you put in your memory stick with a certain data set on it, and then there's a, a huge lamp going, uh, flashlight, which is going red uh, when there's a rich risk of a privacy breach and it stays green when it's safe to publish the data you're uh, willing to publish. Before you can do this, you have to arrange a couple of things. Um, for instance, uh, you have to take all these data sets. And this data set for itself might not have a conflict uh, concerning GDPR. It might be safe to publish this data set. And this other data set, data set 2, might also be safe to be published. <coughs> and a lot of other data sets might, might also be safe in itself to be published. But when it comes to a combination, when it's coming together, and some sort of magic happens, 
it might lead to a, a breach of privacy. You might uncover a personal detail. It might uncover personal information. And that's something we want to avoid. Um, combining data sets <laughs> means connecting dots. In each data set, you have to find a specific point where you can connect it to another data set. The battery is getting low, I think. We have to go to the, to the drinks because <laughs> I have to push the button very hard. Okay, so you find in data set one an element X, and in data set two, you find the same, same sort of element. Uh, find the connection uh, between those two, two, two data sets, and you can make a combination of those two data sets, and you create a new data set. That's something you have to. This is old technology, this is not new. I everyone can do this already been done for years with data set techno database technologies, ETL technologies, so it's not new. But where it comes new technology is when it comes to, and that's also been uh, mentioned already by Sylvan, when it comes to deep learning and when it comes to AI and it comes to pattern recognition. And there you get into risks we are unknown yet of. So if these patterns are going to match to each other, you might also be able to combine data sets in a way which was unexpected before. And then you might get into a risk uh, and you might uh, be violating the GDPR. And as Sylvan pointed out, that's something you don't want to do. So what I'm li really looking forward to is that from your perspective as hackers, as developers, as whoever is uh, uh, smart or intelligent or uh, able to work with these new technologies, is look into these data sets and see if you can find uh, uh, th the more intelligent things like deep learning, artificial and pattern recognition to, uh, to create uh, a new way of combining data sets and see if this combination of data sets will be uh, a breach of your privacy. So you have to be careful with this pattern recognition. We have to be careful if it's just a correla correlation or a causality. Because on the fact of uh, correlations, there's a lot of <coughs> stuff already been done. This is a relation between US spending on science, space, and technology, and suicides by hanging, strangulation, su suffocation. <laughs> or another interesting one is Nicolas Cage has, has done some, some amazing uh, work on, on uh, prediction-wise uh, and correlation. So uh, this is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool uh, and uh, uh, films uh, Nicolas Cage appeared in. Nice correlation. And the last one I want to show you because I loved it. For, I love cheese. <coughs> Sorry, I love cheese. I'm Dutch. I love cheese. So per capita cheese consumption compared to the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. <laughs> Take care that you're not stepping into when you're going to into pa pattern recognition and smart kinds of rec uh, 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 combination of data sets, that it is a causality and it's not a correlation. So be careful. Another example where uh, uh, the, the umbrage or the, the uncovering of personal data might, might come into uh, space is th this is a nice map which has been made by uh, a news agency and it's, it's pointing out the, the amount of burglaries, burglars uh, per uh, thousand inhabitants. And if you go over the uh, with the mouse over it, then you can see uh, you get more information. Yeah, thank you. This will not uncover personal information by because of the fact it's per thousand in, uh, inhabitants. So here you're safe. But if this, if this would have been done on, on a postcode, there could have been an uncovering of uh, a personal uh, information, some sort of, because some areas of post co postal codes are very small. And it might be the case that in some uh, very small post <coughs> postal code area, there might be a burglary, and then you can find, okay, in that specific house, uh, someone has been uh, robbed. So it comes very close to you uh, when you're getting into uh, these kinds of, uh, sharing this kind of information. Um, <coughs> so one of the challenges is combining this, the data sets. But the other challenge is when will it be personal information? And also there, there are some uh, things we have to look into. For instance, uh, is the combination of first name, a number, and the postal code, is that personal information? Someone, is this personal information? Yes or no? Yes. 
Yes, okay, because it's one specific house and you know the first name of one, uh, someone <laughs> living there. Uh, this one, first name, last name, date of birth, personal information. That depends. That depends, because if there are uh, more uh, than just one people who are having this combination, then uh, it might be not personal. Because And, and uh, our Central Bureau of Statistics is having some rules that is the number, if, if the number of uh, occurrences of this combination is less than 10, it's personal, but if it's more, then they say it's, uh, it's not personal information. So I'm very happy that uh, uh, people from the Central Bureau of Stati Statistics will also be uh, at the hackathon. So during the hackathon, you will be able to ask with uh, and, and, and challenge them also, uh, is this combination of uh, information uh, uh, a, a, a possible a privacy breach, yes or no? Um, so, go on, uh, another example. Is this personal information? You're <coughs> so, so Yes. <laughs> This one, last name, postal code, is that personal information? Yes, no, yes, no. Depends on which village. <laughs> Depends on which village, yes. The, the, po the, the, the point is that with just the last name, you have more than one people, you have a family. Yeah, so more inhabitants, so it might be also the risk of uncovering uh, personal information. So, done some exercises on this. Oh, well, the, the, last, uh, the first name and the postal code, Personal information, yes, no? No, I think not. But fr from your answers, you already noticed that it's not always very clear which combination of information is personal, <laughs> yes or no. Uh, so, but, so that's the other thing you have to look into when you're going into this, into this challenge. Um, what do we have available during the hackathon for you to support you uh, in developing? Um, at first, I'm very proud, uh, yes, that uh, I can announce that we have the Central Bureau of Statistics. We are still selecting people from the, from the Central Bureau of Statistics. Uh, so I'm not quite sure who is will be there, but I'm quite sure there will be people who are really uh, knowledgeable in the fact that combining of data sets on deep learning and, and smart technologies will be there. Uh, there will be someone from, uh, with uh, legal expertise from the Ministry of Justice. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm still uh, talking to a lot of people uh, to, uh, to share their knowledge also uh, with me. And I'm there. <laughs> Might be helpful <laughs> also. <laughs> well, what do we expect? At least we do expect an open service or system or whatever, a, bla a black box. It, it, well, a black box, a glass box. You, we have to, you should be able to look into it. <laughs> Um, Preloaded with a lot of open government information because you have to make the comparison between other data sets. The ability to load data to be tested um, and a notification of uh, privacy uh, breaches. So if you come to the hackathon, please take uh, some sort of alert si alerting system. It might be a huge horn or something just to notify everyone of the fact that you found a privacy breach. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm from everything which is open, so of course I would uh, urge you to work on an open, uh, open source solution. Le I'm really looking forward to work with you during the hackathon. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the, the, the solutions coming from this. And I'm, I'm more than convinced that what you're going to make, what you're going to create, uh, will be usable for much other challenges also because I now you're focusing on comparison of data sets uh, as open data sets, but I'm, I'm quite sure if you think through this concept, uh, it's, it's usable for much uh, m many more uh, solutions uh, to be uncovered yet. Um, well, the last slide, Wouter, you already mentioned that I had one minute, five minutes ago. Uh, so we're looking for creativity, fun, cooperation, and success. I'm looking forward to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Um, uh, what I really like is that the, the both challenges we have concerning uh, digital identity and concerning uh, open data and GDPR, I think both of them will be very interesting for not just the five teams working on that challenge, but also for every organization that is present, I think. So it's I'm really hoping for a lot of kruisbestuiving. 
It's I'm a building. not sure how to translate that. <laughs> um, I was thinking about that word. Um, but let's proceed. Um, we have this challenge. Uh, Paul explained it to us very well. Is there someone who would like to ask a question to clarify it or to know what we're talking about? Um, I'm going to give it to the front here, and then I'll see the second question in the back. Please do speak loud. All right. Um, can you please give an indication on the total size of the data sets and how long they go back for? Mm. Uh, the amount of data sets available on, on the open data portal from the, from the government is about 12,000. Um, you can take any data set. It's open data, so you can take any data set you want uh, to work with. But is that those uh, data sets, do they evolve or change with time, and, and wh how long do they go back? Uh, that depends on the, on the data set. Uh, some data sets are, uh, are older, sometimes are uh, real-time data. Um, so it's, it's, it's open data. So everything which is there, for instance, there's, there's information about traffic. There's information about public uh, transport. There's information about a lot of st statistical information. I think almost five to 6,000 uh, data sets are, are, are statistical data sets. Okay, thank you. Um, this is gonna be challenging. Okay. Uh, I did not play Corvo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ivi Vinali and I work for SingularityNet. Uh, so we develop uh, AI. And what I was wondering about this challenge, are people allowed to use other data sets outside of this open government data? I'm going to repeat this to make it very loud <coughs> and clear. The question was if it's allowed to use other data sets than that were provided by the governmental open data portal. Yes, of course you're allowed to do so. Although it's a little bit out of the scope of the, uh, of the challenge. And I, I can explain you why. Because if, um, if you really want to get into personal information, it's very easy to get on the internet and to make a combination of data sets and, and other information where you can uncover um, uh, uh, personal details about someone. But the challenge... The, the, the basic of the challenge is that, that I want to convince a, a, a government organization who is, go, is willing to share information as open data that it's safe for them to do so. Yeah? Right. But let's say that I'm using these open government data sets. Yeah. And I'm also scraping Facebook data and LinkedIn yeah. data. Yeah. I probably for sure can find out exactly with who these people are. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there more? I see a lot of hands. Can, can you throw it towards our gentleman on the left of the hall? Uh, gently. I hope it's not a difficult question so, from uh, Iqbal. Uh, no, no, it's very simple. Uh, is there any data set that describes all, including open data and closed data that collected by by government organizations. Then we can easily answer the last uh, point that you mentioned, that the main target is to, to open as much open data as possible, to convince the government organizations that open data. Yeah, the, 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 the difficult point you address here is the uh, information on the not open data. The open data portal, data.overheid.nl, is, is sharing a lot of open data. And you can read it, it has an API, and you can take all the information from it as you want in any format, JSON, whatever. Uh, but the problem is that you, we don't have a an, 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 an total overview of closed data. There is an ambition to share this data also, uh, to be open what we're not going to be make open. Uh, but that's not being realized yet. Currently, we only have an overview of the open data sets, and that's through data.overheid.nl. Thank you. Um, I think this gentleman over here, uh, please be careful <coughs> with throwing the microphone. Very well, very well. Gerard. <laughs> yeah. Um, blockchains work very well uh, with reward systems. So yeah. I was thinking, uh, would it be possible somewhere to have a reward system? So if you would detect a privacy breach or if you do some work to, to do something in here that somebody gets a reward. I'm, I'm going to repeat this. Um, I think the question is that uh, with blockchain technology, there's a very interesting aspect with rewarding people who have worked on interesting solutions and therefore providing an incentive to work on 
uh, interesting open data breaches. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. That's that's nice idea. I, w I, I would really recommend you to take this into the challenge and into the hackathon, uh, because I did never thought of such a solution yet. Uh, so uh, please take it to Groningen and uh, and uh, build it into your uh, solution. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Are there more hands? I see one more hand over here and one more hand in the front. And let's say let's go to three more questions because we also need to proceed. You can throw it to Silvan if. Hello. Yep. <laughs> I'm I'm wondering, will you be providing test data, with and without breaches? There's uh, there's a lot of test data. Uh, actually, it's even stronger, there is a lot of open data which you can use already. So the test data is is already there. We don't need to supply additional test data because the question is about which open data and the addition of which open data will uncover uh, personal information. So all the data you need is already there as open data. In, in which case you'll have a big problem, right? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Into, very can you give I, I think you come to Groningen. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Can you give it to the gentleman in the front? Yes, I wondered if there's a taxonomy of the meaning of the attributes. The, the question yeah. was if there's a of all the open taxonomy data. of the meaning of the attributes in the data sets, yeah. I think. Um, that, that's, there's, a, there's an easy answer and there's a difficult answer. I'm going to. Uh, I'm trying to give you both. Uh, the simple answer to start with is that all information on uh, data.overheid.l is foreseen with metadata. There is also a standard for this metadata, DCAT, DCAT AP, which is a very open protocol, a thing like that. The problem with this DCAT standard, standard as, as metadata, is that it's only describing and only uh, focusing on the findability of the data, and not enough on the structure of the data. So if you, if you dive into this uh, open data on data.overheid.nl, uh, you will notice that you will find a lot of information about the findability of these data sets, but you will sometimes really have to look into the data to find the real metadata about the description of the columns and the files and things like that. And that might be sometimes a challenge. I, I really r recognize that immediately if you uh, are having, uh, if, if you're getting in, in such uh, such troubles, yes. Okay, I'm going to throw it to our last question poser. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my question is about the breach. When is a breach a breach? Is that when the legal guy says this would be a breach? Is this what I'm designing for, or is it to be the best Sherlock Holmes of the world? Um, if you, I'm, I'm not quite sure if we go, should shift, give this power to, uh, to, the, the, to the legal guys, <laughs> because yes. they don't allow anything. So <laughs> 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 I, I, th I think when you have a good, good discussion with, with uh, the, 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 the lawyers and things, like, and that's the kind of people that they immediately stop anything about data, open data, so they want to go back to the planet we had uh, hundreds of years ago. So, yes. um, but um, I think we should, uh, uh, when a breach is a breach, uh, I, I try to explain it a little bit by having these columns and, and making the black columns that you have an idea of when it is, uh, uh, when it's a, a private, uh, private information. But we already noticed that not everyone was convinced and on the, sh on, on the same page yeah. uh, when it was or it was not. Yeah, as so. soon as my name is King Willem Alexander, yeah. I have no chance. <laughs> you're you're totally clueless. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, but but th then everybody knows who it is because. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I <coughs> I'm more than happy that we are uh, accompan accompanied by uh, the Ministry of uh, uh, of Justice, uh, where where we get legal expertise from, and uh, I ex expect also that we get some uh, legal expertise from the Central Bureau of Statistics. I hope they will join us also on this subject. So. I hope we can work that out uh, during the hackathon uh, also, because that's very dependent on when the light is red or green, yes. So the, the, when I do my challenge, I'm uh, on the one side doing the pattern scanning and the data, and all yeah. those other sides, 
exploring what would be a good definition of a breach. That's the sure, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and that, that's why I, I try to address both of the aspects uh, uh, during my presentation, because when it comes together, then you know when the light is red or green. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for all your attention and questions. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting to note that we're, on the one hand, giving all the legal knowledge we are having now to this ecosystem of the hackathon, but we're also accepting that there are challenges towards open data and GDPR <laughs> we might not have thought about. Um, that is something we can accept, that we, uh, we want to find out. Um, thank you so much, Paul. Um, we're moving on. Uh, It's also very open to have people asking questions to public officials about what they're working on every day. So um, that's very interesting to experience. We're going to move on to the next thing, which is something new, I think. It is the ecosystem of this Odyssey Hackathon, which is posing a challenge by itself, which is going to be presented by Rutger. Thanks again, uh, Wouter, and uh, I'm, I'm very inspired. Of course, I mean, the, the digital identity stuff is, is really important, but this privacy detector thing sparks also the imagination a lot, I think. I was thinking about maybe the legal guys should have some power, but then the other way around. Uh, what if there is a DAO where every um, data sh report of the government should be reported. The DAO hands over a certificate, and once there's a breach, the certificate is drawn and the data set is extracted again, or something like that. I think there's there's a lot of uh, yeah crazy ideas you can think uh, in this uh, in this challenge, uh, and and uh, I definitely go uh, talk with uh, JP, who was uh, the last question because uh, he he's basically owning crazy idea thinking. Um, so uh, the last part of the, uh, the track deep dives, uh, our own uh, challenge. And um, when we started to think of the vision uh, of commonization, of creating open digital public infrastructure, we, we saw a lot of opportunities uh, to create new markets, where, where people are able to help out in the best possible way, to reinvent the way we collaborate as humans. The, the way we, the, we reinvent massive collaboration to solve problems, and specifically problems that <coughs> no one owns by themselves, right? As mentioned in the trailer. But you encounter a problem when funding the digital commons because they belong to no one, right? Um, but then they say, oh, we have ICOs, right? But then it uh, turns out that um, yeah, the, 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 the incentives, the interest of all the players involved do not really align. So you can call it a utility token, but that might not be the solution always. Perfect. I am dying out here. How much? One dollar worth of lemon coin to is approximately a thousand lemon coins. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Get that centralized currency out of my face. This is 2018. I only accept cryptocurrency here, preferably lemon coin. I don't have whatever a lemon coin is. Well, a lemon coin's my utility token. It doesn't have a lot of utility yet, but we're working on it. One day it might go to a dollar. Cool, I don't have lemon coin. Fine, I'll also take Bitcoin or Doge. I'm sorry, buddy. I'll come back for you someday. What? You, you'd need like 200 of those. How much is one doge even worth? One doge always equals one doge. 
Okay, fine. How do I get lemon coin? Why is this so difficult? I can sense your frustration. Think about it. It's the future of business. A trustless system without third parties. So to get lemon coin, I just need you to create an account on this third party exchange. I'm going to need your passport, bank info, social security number, and a selfie with today's date. I thought you said this was a trustless system. Oh. It is as soon as the exchange trusts you. You, you could trust us. We are the number one crypto exchange in all of Krash Krako Krashimia. I don't think that's a real country. Look, Kremlin. You, you can make this in Croatia. Easy transaction if you just follow the protocol. Okay? Okay. Smile. Say KYC. Okay, so this will take uh, three to five days to process. Uh, after that, when you are approved, uh, you would probably not be notified. So check back in uh, a week or so. This is ridiculous. You're telling me that if anybody wants to buy lemonade, they need to go through this process? Yeah, I'm telling you this is the future of business. I've already got like a dozen customers. All right, so when funding projects where you don't know what, what will come out of it exactly or what the business model will be. Uh, it turns out we, uh, we, lear we can learn quite a lot from uh, how ICOs played out and I think we will learn a lot more. Um, but where do we come from? Uh, we come from the VC model, basically, to fund startups. Uh, of course, fueled largely by the way uh, Silicon Valley was doing uh, business. Um, but that doesn't really work either for these kinds of projects. Imagine you go to a venture capitalist and you say, will you please invest in this open source project which has no owner, everybody can build on top of it and uh, everybody can use it uh, without my permission. <laughs> Crickets. So also the VC wants ownership, right? Um, if we look at the startup model, the VC makes money in two ways. Either there's a huge among us, uh, amount of profit and he stays in there or the company gets sold. That's basically the two flavors you have. And this is also, uh, you have to invest in the equity of the startup. So that's where all the risk is, right? How many uh, of the startups fail? Well, most of them. So <coughs> there are a couple of problems and they are difficult to solve as well when we talk about funding the digital commons and open digital public infrastructure. This summer, we started a bit of a journey um, in uh, uh, token engineering with uh, a couple of our partners. We couldn't take them all on board, but, but uh, a lot of them were. And we gained some help from, uh, from some friends in the, in the, in the international uh, crypto and blockchain space. And I want to share a bit of, uh, of uh, that journey with you. Uh, oh wait, first challenge. The challenge is to create a new type of investment vehicle, right? Where the incentives between the ones that build and invest are aligned, also with the in incentives of the user. It should drive adoption, not <laughs> keep users away from adopting it. And we, we do it, how can we, how can we take the startup risk out of it? Because that's what basically causes the stress in the model. So how can we make the digital comic commons economically viable? Look at this space as a curiosity. Look at the blockchain space, the crypto space, as something that wants to prove a new paradigm in the world. It's not something that has to be production ready. It's something that has to make people rethink social values, money, collaborative commons. It's a big experiment mm -hmm. and it's where like, too much technology converges with sociology, philosophy, ethics, communities and it will give the rise to what we call the collaborative commons where people start managing resources together rather than trying to own all the resources.
Well, it's about looking at how to create infrastructure to create ecosystems in this space that would launch and nurture new ideas, projects, all the way through to market. A token where you say, what we will try to do is create an environment where we can actually create, indeed, that new society. And it doesn't stop here in the Netherlands. It, it will go beyond the borders. It will become an international challenge. But And that is also why it's so great that all the original thinkers are around the table. I think this whole ecosystem is about transparency and being honest in uh, wanting to make the world a better place. So that's why it's important to have everybody in the room. Typically, when you've got meetings like this, you're shopping for momentum. They've got momentum, they've got the crowd, they've got all these people that want it to happen. It's really a machine design question. So this is not about us, it's about enabling the ecosystem to grow to that next level. Yes, the next adventure. This is really like intellectually a next step, or how can we, let's say, find out a way to crowdfund innovation, uh, in a responsible manner and keep the independence of the ecosystem. The vision is very clear and people want it to happen, but you want it to happen in a prudent, regulated way. I was here to, uh, to see where, where we stand, where we can contribute. I think for us it's really, really important to see if we can support startups in the blockchain domain and what holds them back and try to remove barriers. Collaborating with the regulators and the supervisors to see uh, if we can set up a system which is, uh, which is of high quality, basically certified. People of the blockchain world thinking about how to create an ecosystem that supports the themes people who have dreams and are building them in the hackathon or that people who want to bet on dreams get actually some return. It's nothing like this has ever really been done before. It's a, it's a new type of finance and it's a new type of economic organization. So as we design these governance systems, we have to think ahead and, and also look at history and, and, and work out you know, which kinds of problems are likely to arise. And what this means is that we need a multi-stakeholder system. So it needs to be something where there is proper governance in place, where investors can come in and, and make their returns, but where you also uh, you know, bring everybody along on the journey with you. But what I find interesting is how can we combine these original thinkers and combine them to the mainstream? Because that's what we're talking about right now. We're in this together. It's a global play. And in order to succeed, we need to have maximum inclusion. So we have to have the regulatory stakeholders, the banks, the insurance companies, the governments, and also the crypto people. Because they have the vision. Uh, you know, it used to be crypto anarchy. Now people understand it has a positive connotation as well. And if we combine those two elements, I think we can definitely build a framework for success. Fixing the mess in the world and fixing the mess in crypto because crypto is a mess. Unlocks. It will be a, a real challenge to create a new finance model or ecosystem with the Dutch government and with the Dutch banks. Uh, uh, and it will be awesome to do that in the Netherlands. What's going on here in the Netherlands is very unique because uh, Dutch chain has pulled together government and industry and the you know startups, education, all of these things kind of talking and working together in a way that I haven't seen this level of engagement anywhere else in the world. If you're going to start a movement, you've got to have somebody who's going to bring everybody along and get everybody to participate. So, imagine you walk in at the hackathon on Friday, and on Monday, you present as a winner, and perhaps a couple of weeks, or even if it's a couple of months later, what if your solution, not you, your solution, would own hundreds of thousands or even millions of euros to be executed, to be developed, and to be adopted? because that's what we're going for. So we have sketched, this is a sketch, of a new DAO concept. It has no owners, no shares. It's open source. Two types of cert certificates, at least. You have votes, and you have a ref share. There is a set balance between the stakeholders. So, oh, we call them stakeholders, by the way. Um, and there's something special about this balance. Only the investors dilute. We, we flip the coin. 
right? So that's something else. What is also interesting here is that we cap the multiplier. So in venture capital, the game is different. Because of all the high risk, you want to increase the multiplier as high as you can, which is quite stressful. It's because most of the projects fail. But in this case, you don't invest in the startup. You invest in the open protocol itself. So let's say, for the sake of having a number, the cap is a maximum of 4x. Then the question for the investor becomes not how much or how high can the multiplier be, but how fast can I get my money back, my 4x, which is capped already, which is set. It's a non-speculative -specul environment, fully regulated, and of course it includes a governance model. It's a sort of joint venture where the ecosystem from which this arises holds 10%. Why do you want that? Well, you want this ecosystem, could be Singularity Net, could be Ocean Protocol, could be a ministry, could be Odyssey. But then all of a sudden, it becomes interesting. The question becomes for people, perhaps, perhaps in this room, on what level do you want to help? Would you like to help all the protocols a bit? Because then it would be interesting to have an ecosystem token. Or do you want to help the project itself? Right? And in case the uh, uh, arbitrage needs to be done, uh, because there's some decision making that needs to be done in this joint venture, of course the ecosystem can help out as well. When you look at the ref share, and we're looking, I'm looking uh, especially for uh, open public infrastructure where it's very clear to see what must go from A to B, and it is transaction driven, we could create a model where um, the adoption rate, which is of course <laughs> very low in the beginning and it gets higher, and the price per transaction, so the higher the adoption, the lower the price per transaction. And it's very easy. If you invest money, you have an upside on the price per tr transaction. And then you can calculate when you get your money back. So you turn your investment, your cost in the IT infrastructure into an asset that has a ref share, a revenue stream. So what do we want to enable? We want to enable a shared incentive to drive adoption. Because if you are an investor, you really want those transactions to happen. This is the only way you can get your money out. Yeah, or sell your tokens to another investor, but you can't sell your tokens outside of the entity. So the builders, the ecosystem, and the investors, which may very well be competitors, have a shared incentive to drive the adoption. I even have an incentive to get my competitors investing with me if the protocol is on the right level. So uh, that would allow collaboration between entities that don't share the same interest per se, but have a mutual benefit from the protocol. Um, and, of course, you want to turn the, the cost uh, to as low as possible, and that means that yeah, kind of work is done, the protocol runs, then the cost should be as low as possible, <coughs> and that is true because then the adoption is high. All the money was out. Um, well, we have no risk of the startup failure anymore because, of course, this can be forked. So if the startup fails, you still have the DAO, you still have the project, you still have the money in, and then the investors and the DAO can look for other builders. The other way around can happen, of course, as well. If the builders cannot 
align anymore with the investors, they can go their own way as well. well. Of course, such an entity is programmable. So turning it into an investment vehicle is, is the start. Uh, but ABBA will show later on that you can think of more features and modules uh, what this uh, entity could do. This is, of course, uh, <laughs> highly experimental. And we uh, need to explore all kinds of stuff, right? So uh, what kind of tokens do we need? Um, maybe in the now, but also in the future. Uh, for example, what problem should the ecosystem work on? Well, a signal to signaling token could help. What kind of dashboards do we need? Can I, as an investor or as an ecosystem, see exact exactly on this trajectory of adoption, when will I get my money back, or what will the price level be on the current uh, trajectory of adoption, stuff like that? Uh, how will we handle protocol improvement proposals? Uh, how will we vote for them? How will we review them when they are done? So all these kinds of things need to be thought of when designing such a system. Um, of course, how will you set the transaction price? <coughs> right? is, it, is, it, uh, is the transaction price cheap enough for adoption? Right. And of course, how will all the interfaces look? But that's uh, in the beginning, it will be quite basic. Um, small example of um, what, uh, uh, what kind of protocol we are looking for and what kind of projects are we looking for to, uh, to, uh, to simulate. Um, the winners of the EU Blockathon we held in uh, Brussels uh, uh, last year, we were lucky enough to, uh, to be able to, to contribute uh, our experience and knowledge in this, uh, uh, in this hackathon. And the winners uh, uh, presented also last Monday on the Tech Deep Dive. They have created a, uh, a virtual twin protocol to, uh, to increase the level if of integrity in the supply chain. So a token is uh, released by the manufacturer, for example, of the Samsung phone that's over <laughs> lying over there. But for example, you have a phone and you have a virtual twin of the phone. The rule is very simple. If it if the phone gets out of the factory, you initiate the token and the logistics party that gets it from the factory only accept the package if he also gets the virtual twin. And the customs have a special green lane for virtual twin packages, but it goes from one party to the other. With the virtual twin token, you can prove that you are the owner of a legitimate product. right? If you go one step further, yeah. one of our challenges is a cargo insurance protocol. It works a bit differently because then if you hold the cargo, you are responsible for it and therefore you can be insured and reinsured. What you can see here is that there are many stakeholders. Yeah, so the the, at the Blockathon, we had uh, uh, KLM Cargo, we had DHL, FedEx, we had <coughs> several manufacturers, we had um, several uh, uh, um, retailers like Alibaba and Amazon, and they all had an interest to make this happen. And when everybody has to pay up, that's when it gets difficult, because there's no vehicle for that yet. So this is the type of product where we hope to combine the, the urge to create such an infrastructure with uh, uh, um, the drive to, to get your money back uh, and that you are, you are doing something with competitors but you can still gain from that. So I invite you to help us uh, explore uh, this, uh, this, uh, this new type of investing. Hopefully we can go beyond the venture capital model. Hopefully we can uh, go beyond the ICO model. And uh, in, in this sketch are many, many things
things that need to be proven or unproven, but it is as far as we have come today. And we invite you on our odyssey to get um, to really get uh, a prototype working at uh, at the hackathon. Um, and what are we looking, or, or how do we want to get to that prototype? <coughs> that is uh, something which uh, Abe Scholte will uh, will explain after me. But uh, thanks for now. Thanks, Rutger. Not sure how I am. I have no time. idea why there would be any purpose for me to say something now. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we should definitely go to the technical guy working on tokenization, Abe Scholte from Odyssey. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is my name, Ab Scholte. I'm the tokenization lead at Odyssey. And uh, Rutger has just explained to you the project that we are working on. And in this talk, I would like to explain how we would like to build that at the hackathon. So the goal is to build a prototype for the protocol investment uh, vehicle by creating a DAO, a decentralized autonomous uh, organization, or a tokenized ecosystem. And the word ecosystem here is important because we're trying to solve a problem that is complex, interconnected, uh, there's multi, uh, multiple stakeholders. And so the solution should also be very complex. And this is what Willie Smith talked about also last Monday at the Technical Deep Dive. He's also working with vastly uh, complex problems. Um, and he says, you cannot shoot those problems with silver bullets. You have to think about the problem as a whole and think in very complex solutions. So ecosystems, just like this one, a rainforest, they consist of multiple entities. So there's uh, trees, there's smaller plants, animals, insects, bacteria, fungi, like mycelium, but also the people that live in and around the forests, that live from those forests. And all of those entities, they exchange and transact with each other, whether it is by water or energy or money. And the funny thing is, is if you want to digitize such an ecosystem, all of those transactions should be converted to tokens. Because tokens, they are, in essence, information carriers. So the tokens, they tell what someone has contributed to the ecosystem. What have they done? What was the actual value? How big was this value? Um, so the token can measure that and say something about that. And now also it becomes apparent that if you have this huge ecosystem with multiple stakeholders that transact things, various things, that you should not have one token that solves all. And now I'm going to steal a quote from uh, uh, Professor Jan Jonkers, uh, which he said last Wednesday during his uh, track deep dive. And I'm also going to paraphrase it a bit. And that is, if you have a complex system based on one token, that would be the same as basing a whole uh, food system just on beer, which is quite intelligent, I would say. <laughs> so it's about variety. And yeah, <laughs> it sounds good, but it doesn't work. That's, uh, <laughs> so it's about the variety in tokens. So when designing such a tokenized ecosystem, think about all the different kinds of tokens that can be there. So there's different ways to uh, categorize tokens, and this is the one I tend to like. Uh, so for example, you have tokens of value, aka Bitcoin, and the value of those tokens is uh, defined by the uh, equation of exchange, MV equals MP, uh, PQ, economic term. Uh, there's also crypto collectibles, non-fungible tokens, tokens that uh, only have like, that only exist one by one. You have security tokens, which are basically financial assets and can give rights to a future cash flow. And then there's utility tokens, and they're vastly uh, interesting. So this is the one that I uh, expanded, but you can expand all of them. Um, so you, utility tokens are, for example, stable coins. So there can be one coin in your whole system that is packed to a um, standard value. 
or a value that is non-volatile like the euro or hopefully also dollar. Uh, and this makes, this uh, uh, helps the whole ecosystem to become a bit more stable. Then you have, uh, for example, tokens that you can burn and mint. Uh, and this means that the amount of tokens within the whole ecosystem can be controlled. Uh, you also have work tokens. So these are the tokens where you can prove that you actually did something, that you provided a certain type of service to the whole ecosystem, whether this may be that you provided storage or that you looked at some data or provided some data. And there's tokens for access control. If you want to have access to a certain type of device, then you can prove that access, that you have right to that access with the token. There's signaling and curation. That is something that Ocean Protocol works with. That is that if you have a data set, for example, and you look at that data set, how can someone say that the data set is valuable, that other people should have to take a look at it? There's tokens for that as well. So now that I've explained how complex this challenge is, let's build it. Um, I'm going to explain you what teams we're looking for, what type of strategy you should pursue, and the tools that are available. Because please make no mistake, there's a lot of experts around this world who have thought long and hard about this. And we really stand on the shoulder of giants. Uh, there's a lot of expertise out there, open source. So please be wary to use it. Would be a shame to reinvent the wheel again. So the team, just like other teams at the hackathon, uh, <coughs> consists of five to six people. And the com com uh, composition of all the teams should be um, variant. So don't come to the hackathon with just five developers. There should be other people in there as well. Uh, so the team composition <coughs> should look something like this. I mean, skills in your team should ha uh, uh, come from these areas. So machine learning, data science, systems engineering, product development, crypto, uh, crypto economics, market design, but be wary, this is a dream team. So it would be very nice if you have all of these skills in your team, but it's also okay if you miss one or two. Um, actually, when I'm going to talk about the strategy that you should pursue, I got this from this book. It's called Token Ecosystem Creation. It was made by one of our partners, Outlier Ventures, and this book basically describes from scratch to end how you should pursue designing a token. So, for example, they talk about key deliverables that you think about and how you can design a whole timeline that you should first uh, start with the discovery phase, design phase, and then a deployment phase. They talk about the token utility canvas, where you can to, uh, think about all the stakeholders in, their, uh, in your system, what they do, what you want them to do, and how you can design utility tokens around that. Also, if you have any assumptions, they have strategies for that as well, how you can tackle all of your assumptions and turn them into actual tangible uh, design requirements, for example. But um, in the end, this whole book boils down to these points. Collaborate, think in complex structures, um, do it in an evidence-based way and experiment a lot, and be pragmatic and not dogmatic. So this means that this book is very pragmatic. There's a lot of tools in here that I can use. And even though I keep this under my pillow when I sleep, this is not the Holy Bible. So use from this what is useful, but still look around for, for other things that might be useful to you. And also be agile. And I know this is uh, uh, another buzzword, but this is what I mean by it. Spaghetti towers. I don't know if you know these. Um, I know these from uh, team building events. They're fun, but sometimes a bit cringeworthy. But um, it goes like this. You have a big room. There's a lot of teams in there. And every team gets the same amount of spaghetti strands. You get some tape and one marshmallow. And in 10 minutes, you have to build up a tower with your team. And the team with the highest tower, with the marshmallow on top, the standing tower wins. And thankfully, or I mean, Tom Wujek, he uh, investigated uh, the teams that were building these towers. And he found out that the best teams 
that always win are teams full of architects. Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> but the second best team, does anybody know? Children. Children, yes. Very true. Because the thing that happens is that teams that start, uh, start out on this 10-minute odyssey is first they decide on who the leader is. It takes a lot of time. Then they're going to decide on what the best strategy is. Then, oh shit, only a few minutes left. Let's build the tower and put the marshmallow on top. It falls. What children do is they start out directly, fail, start again, fail, start again, fail. So they learn a lot. And this is what I want you to do at the hackathon as well. Then for the tools, uh, there's a huge global co community, the token engineering community, and all of their knowledge is accrued on this website, tokenengineering.net. They also have a YouTube channel. Check it out. Please get lost. It's an amazing place. Um, then we also work together with uh, Block Science. They will be <coughs> present at the hackathon as well. What they're really good at is thinking in complex systems. So they don't look at siloed problems, like social, economic, technological, and physical, but they combine them all. And over here, for example, they first look at the macro state. Like, what do you want people, how do you want people to behave within your system? And only then they go <coughs> one level, uh, level below. Okay, so, so what should be the in incentives? What is the context in which they behave? One layer below, you're going to define the mechanics and the actual incentives then you know what you actually need to prove cryptographically. And below that is the actual data that, is, that needs to be trustworthy. And they have a lot of models and simulations that you can use uh, when you're building very complex systems like this. So again, the goal at the hackathon is to build a prototype for the protocol investment vehicle, but you should be able to simulate and model your solutions. So at the hackathon, there will be other protocols to uh, look at, and your solution should be able to model and simulate how this works, how this actually works. So it shouldn't be, you shouldn't uh, build like a solution that completely works already, but a prototype that you can model and simulate on. That's very important. Then next to that, Rutger already introduced it a bit, is because we're talking about tokens, and I'm a big token fan, there's a lot of things you can do with tokens. And I mean, I can talk about uh, some ideas that I have, but I would really like to know from you what you have in mind. So imagine them, explore them, but you don't have to build them at the hackathon, but we want to know your ideas in that. The most important thing is the prototype. Uh, and again, please don't take that much time on designing a strategy. I rather want you to fill a couple of times because it goes much faster. And since finally, guys, we made it last week, yay. Um, this is the last talk. Uh, a quick reminder on hackathon dates. Uh, the hackathon starts now. <laughs> please keep that in mind. So if you have an idea, if you have a team, if you want to talk about this challenge or any other challenge, talk to us because we are ready to answer questions. We are ready to help out. We have a whole set of tools. We have a whole consortium. But if you need anything else, please come and talk to us. This hackathon is not about, the, the hackathon is not the end of a journey. It's not about winning there. It's actually the hackathon is the start. So please come prepared. And thank you very much for listening. Questions? Yeah. Thank you, Abbe. Uh, I have a prediction. I think the winners of this track will be a little crazy, yes. but perhaps a little brilliant as well. So I'm very <laughs> glad to host this. Um, yeah, yeah, is there anyone who would like a question about this challenge? I have some, but um, is anyone who uh, wants to know something more about what is posed over here? Or is there All people clear. That's cool. Yes, I see two of them. I, can I throw it in the back first? Please do catch. Oh. Um, yeah, I heard uh, it's a great idea. Uh, I, I heard, to my, in my view, a lot of similarities to UATP, 
uh, uh, visions of uh, focafet.org. Sounds yeah. great. I haven't heard them yet. Yeah, I, I, I know them. I know uh, Floris quite well. Um, Can you elaborate I think he, on that? He, he describes a, a way a protocol could work, but it's not, an, it's not a vehicle or a token system, to my understanding. So I think it could be definitely helpful and would love uh, if Floris would be there, but uh, it's not a, a working DAO. So that's what we want to create. I understand that one. The DAO is not in there, I think, but it's an ecosystem. And uh, I, 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 I think I know what you guys are after with a token, but that's just the meaning or a tool. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, to my understanding, you want to achieve those different states of context uh, yeah. validity and trust, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which can be achieved in different ways. And I think True. that's in the uh, UATP yeah. ecosystem. Or about, uh, I'd like to share some thoughts on that. Cool. Yes, please. Okay. Talk, talk Thank you. Yeah, and indeed, um, the token is not an end. I mean, mm -hmm. I've talked about tokenized ecosystems, but we have still have to investigate if the token is the best solution. It might not be. I just looked something up, and uh, the translation of Kruisbestuiving is, is <laughs> pollination. <laughs> Maybe that's the thing we need over here. Um, can you throw the box to the gentleman over here? Um, I had a question. You were um, talking about uh, modeling of the token system. Do you know of any tools that are uh, available to do that modeling with? Uh, uh, could, you, could you repeat that a little louder, please? Yeah. Are there any tools available to model uh, a token system? Yeah, indeed. So, so on the, the tokenengineering.net website, you can find some registries of, of uh, models that are open to use. Block Science also has some models open <coughs> to use, some of them not open. Uh, but I'm not sure about how well they want to open this, uh, uh, these models at the, the hackathon. But they, they will guide you through it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I see another question in a gentleman behind you. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned 45% um, uh, investors, 45% uh, builders, and 10% ecosystem. Is that a design constraint on the system, or is there some uh, explanation behind that a little bit? No, it's not per se a design constraint. Um, it's something that, that keeps coming back, uh, that you, we want to explore this joint venture-like construction. Uh, to have uh, an absolute balance between the builders and the investors uh, in a way that uh, they always need each other to move uh, forward. Um, so this is why we, we have it in our sketch. Um, if equilibrium uh, and better alignment can be achieved uh, in, in alternative ways, we are very open to that. This is, uh, this is our... Uh, simplest way of thinking uh, and we want to keep things uh, because th the interesting part when you do these token engineering sessions I think is to uh, to make things not complex but complicated and that's not the same thing uh, so uh, having a simple model can be very complex but not complicated so uh, we want to get the complicated stuff out of the way and make things really easy to understand um, in a way, what Tom also mentioned in the, in the video, we want this to be understood by the mainstream. I want to be able to explain this to everyone eh, because more and more people will need to be involved in, in this ecosystem uh, without any boundaries. <coughs> so that's why we're, we're looking at something that everybody can work with and what everybody can understand, and that is as simple as a share, but works in a different way. Thank you. Great. Um, I also just had a point about um, Block Science's uh, simulation and modeling tool. If anybody would like some more information, I'm uh, taking some names and emails for um, the release of the, uh, basically they're hoping to open source within 2019 um, for this uh, tool. And there's some closed beta that's going to be coming out fairly soon. So if anybody would like more information, I can take uh, information and pass it on to Michael Zargum at Block Science. Thank you, sir. Cool. Is Thanks there for sharing. more people who have Questions, 
before we go to our drinks. Uh, I think. Yeah, now. now yeah. Are you thirsty? Yeah. Ah, who dares? The D word. Sorry, sorry the D word. Um, I think then we're going to go towards our ecosystem get together in uh, liquid form. Uh, can, can we have a huge round of applause for, uh, for Wouter for guiding us to the, to the program? Um, thanks, Rutger. And uh, thanks to all you, you and all your colleagues, the ministry and also the ministry for having us here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it was wonderful of having all of these people over here. Um, for me, it's really an experience of, okay, or these people are nuts or these people are brilliant, but I do think we have the duty to find out. Um, and I think we're going to do that in the couple, next couple of months. And uh, let's find each other and uh, have some drinks and have a great weekend. Thank you all. Thank you.